The School for Scandal by Richard Brinsley Sheridan Prologue Written by David Garrick A School for Scandal Tell me, I beseech you, Needs there a school this modish art to teach you? No need of lessons now, the knowing think, We might as well be taught to eat and drink. Caused by a dearth of scandal, Should the vapours distress our fair ones, let them read the papers. Their powerful mixtures such disorders hit. Crave what you will, there's quantum sufficit. Lord, cries my lady Wormwood, who loves tattle, and puts much salt and pepper in her prattle, just risen at noon, all night at cards, when threshing strong tea and scandal. Bless me, how refreshing! Give me the paper's lisp, how bold and free! Sips. Last night Lord L. Sips. Was caught with Lady D. For aching heads, what charming sal volatile! Sips. If Mrs. B. will still continue flirting, we hope she'll draw, or will undraw, the curtain. Fine satire pause in public all abuse it, but by ourselves. Sips. Our praise we can't refuse it. Now, Lisp, read you, there at that dash and star. Yes, ma'am, a certain lord had best beware, Who lives not twenty miles from Grosvenor Square, For should he Lady W. find willing, Wormwood is bitter. Oh, that's me, the villain! Throw it behind the fire, And never more let that vile paper come within my door. Thus at our friends we laugh who feel the dart, To reach our feelings we ourselves must smart. Is our young bard so young to think that he can stop The full spring-tide of calumny? Knows he the world so little and its trade? Alas, the devil's sooner raised than laid. So strong, so swift, the monster there is no gagging. Cut scandal's head off, still the tongue is wagging. Proud of your smiles once lavishly bestowed, Again our young Don Quixote takes the road. To show his gratitude he draws his pen, And seeks his hydra, scandal, in his den. For your applause all perils he would through. He'll fight, that's right, a cavaliero true, Till every drop of blood, that's ink, is spilt for you. Act One, Scene One, Lady Sneerwell's House. Discovered Lady Sneerwell at the dressing table, Snake drinking chocolate. The paragraphs you say, Mr. Snake, were all inserted. They were, madam, and as I copied them myself in a faint hand, there can be no suspicion whence they came. Did you circulate the report of Lady Brittle's intrigue with Captain Bostall? That's in as fine a train as your ladyship could wish. In the common course of things, I think it must reach Mrs. Clackett's ears within four and twenty hours. And then, you know, the business is as good as done. Why, truly, Mrs. Clackett has a very pretty talent, and a great deal of industry. A true, madam, and has been tolerably successful in her day. To my knowledge, she has been the cause of six matches being broken off, and three sons disinherited, of four forced elopements and as many close confinements, nine separate maintenances and two divorces. Nay, I have more than once traced her causing a tete-a-tete -tete in the town and country magazine, when the parties, perhaps, had never seen each other's face before in the course of their lives. She certainly has talents, but her manner is gross. Tis very true. She generally designs well, has a free tongue and a bold invention, but her colouring is too dark, and her outlines often extravagant. She wants that delicacy of tint and mellowness of sneer which distinguishes your ladyship's scandal. You are partial, Snake. Not in the least. Everybody allows that Lady Sneerwell can do more with a word or a look than many can with the most laboured detail, even when they happen to have a little truth on their side to support it. 
Yes, my dear snake, and I am no hypocrite to deny the satisfaction I reap from the success of my efforts. Wounded myself in the early part of my life by the envenomed tongue of slander, I confess I have since known no pleasure equal to the reducing others to the level of my own injured reputation. Nothing can be more natural. But, Lady Sneerwell, there is one affair in which you have lately employed me, wherein, I confess, I am at a loss to guess your motives. I conceive you mean with respect to my neighbour, Sir Peter Teasel, and his family. I do. Here are two young men, to whom Sir Peter has acted as a kind of guardian since their father's death, the eldest possessing the most amiable character and universally well spoken of, the youngest, the most dissipated and extravagant young fellow in the kingdom, without friends or character, the former an avowed admirer of your ladyship, and apparently your favourite, the latter attached to Maria, Sir Peter's ward, and confessedly beloved by her. And now, on the face of these circumstances, it is utterly unaccountable to me why you, the widow of a city knight, with a good jointure, should not close with the passion of a man of such character and expectations as Mr. Surface, and more so, why you should be so uncommonly earnest to destroy the mutual attachment subsisting between his brother Charles and Maria. Then at once, to unravel this mystery, I must inform you that love has no share whatever in the intercourse between Mr. Surface and me. No. His real attachment is to Maria, or her fortune, but finding in his brother a favoured rival, he has been obliged to mask his pretensions and profit by my assistance. Yet still I am more puzzled why you should interest yourself in his success. How dull you are! Cannot you surmise the weakness which I hitherto, through shame, have concealed even from you? Must I confess that Charles, that libertine, that extravagant, that bankrupt in fortune and reputation, that he it is for whom I am thus anxious and malicious, and to gain whom I would sacrifice everything? Now, indeed, your conduct appears consistent. But how came you and Mr. Service so confidential? For our mutual interest. I have found him out a long time since. I know him to be artful, selfish, and malicious, in short, a sentimental knave, while with Sir Peter, and indeed with all his acquaintance, he passes for a youthful miracle of prudence, good sense, and benevolence. Yes, yet Sir Peter vows he has not his equal in England, and above all he praises him as a man of sentiment. True, and with the assistance of his sentiment and hypocrisy, he has brought Sir Peter entirely into his interest with regard to Maria, while poor Charles has no friend in the house, though, I fear, he has a powerful one in Maria's heart, against whom we must direct our schemes. Enter Servant. Mr. Surface. Show him up. Exit Servant. Enter Joseph Surface. My dear Lady Snowwell, how do you do today? Mr. Snake, you're most obedient. Snake has just been rallying me on our mutual attachment, but I have informed him of our real views. You know how useful he has been to us, and believe me, the confidence is not ill-placed. Madam, it is impossible for me to suspect a man of Mr. Snake's uh, sensibility and discernment. Well, well, no compliments now. But tell me when you saw your mistress, Maria, or, what is more material to me, your brother. I have not seen either since I left you, but I can inform you that they never meet. Some of your stories have taken a good effect on Maria. Ah, my dear snake, the merit of this belongs to you. But do your brother's distresses increase? Every hour. I am told he is at another execution in the house yesterday. In short, his dissipation and extravagance exceed anything I have ever heard of. Poor Charles. True, madam. Notwithstanding his vices, one can't help feeling for him. Poor Charles. I'm sure I wish it were in my power to be of any essential service to him. For the man who does not share in the distresses of a brother, even though merited by his own misconduct, deserves— Oh, Lord, 
You are going to be moral and forget that you are among friends. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'll keep that sentiment till I see Sir Peter. However, it certainly is a charity to rescue Maria from such a libertine who, if he is to be reclaimed, can only be so by a person of your ladyship's superior accomplishments and understanding. I believe, Lady Sneerwell, here's company coming. I'll go and copy the letter I mentioned to you. Mr. Surface, you're most obedient. Exit Snake. Sir, you're very devoted. <sighs> Lady Snowell, I am very sorry you've put any further confidence in that fellow. Why so? I have lately detected him in frequent conference with old Rowley, who was formerly my father's steward, and has never, you know, been a friend of mine. And do you think he would betray us? Nothing more likely, take my word for it. Lady Snowell, that fellow hasn't virtue enough to be faithful, even to his own villainy. Ah, Maria. Enter Maria. Maria, my dear, how do you do? What's the matter? Oh, there is that disagreeable lover of mine, Sir Benjamin Backbite, has called at my guardians, with his odious uncle Crabtree. So I slipped out and ran hither to avoid them. Is that all? Oh, if my brother Charles had been of the party, madam, perhaps he would not have been so much alarmed. Nay, now you are severe, for I dare swear the truth of the matter is, Maria heard you were here. But, my dear, what has Sir Benjamin done that you would avoid him so? Oh, he has done nothing. But tis but what he has said. His conversation is a perpetual libel on all his acquaintance. I am the worst of it is, there is no advantage in not knowing him, for he'll abuse a stranger just as soon as his best friend. And his uncle's as bad. Nay, but we should make allowance. Sir Benjamin is a wit and a poet. For my part, I confess, madam. Wit loses its respect with me when I see it in company with malice. What do you think, Mr. Surface? No, oh, certainly, madam, to smile at the jest which plants a thorn in another's breast is to become a principal in the mischief. Pshaw! There's no possibility of being witty without a little ill-nature. The malice of a good thing is the barb that makes it stick. What's your opinion, Mr. Surface? To be sure, madam, that conversation where the spirit of raillery is suppressed will ever appear tedious and insipid. Well, I'll not debate on how far scandal may be allowed, but in a man I am sure it is always contemptible. We have pride, envy, rivalship, and a thousand motives to depreciate each other. But the male Salandra must have the cowardice of a woman before he can reduce one. Enter servant. Madam, Mrs. Candor is below. And if your ladyship's at leisure, we'll leave her carriage. Beg her to walk in. Exit, servant. Now, Maria, here is a character to your taste. For though Mrs. Candor is a little talkative, everybody allows her to be the best-natured and best sort of woman. Yes, with a very gross affection of good nature and benevolence. She does more mischief than the direct malice of old Crabtree. Faith, that's true, Lady Snowell. Whenever I hear the current running against the characters of my friends, I never think them in such danger as when Candor undertakes their defence. Hush, here she is. Enter Mrs. Candor. My dear Lady Snowell, how have you been this century? Mr. Surface, what news do you hear? Though indeed it is no matter, for I think one hears nothing else but scandal. Oh, just so indeed, ma'am. Oh, Maria. Child, what is the whole affair off between you and Charles? His extravagance, I presume. The town talks of nothing else. Indeed, I am very sorry, ma'am. The town is not better employed. True, true, child, but there's no stopping people's tongues. I own I was hurt to hear it, as I indeed was to learn from the same quarter that your guardian, Sir Peter, and Lady Teasel have not agreed lately as well as could be wished. Tis so strangely impertinent for people to busy themselves so. Very true, child. But what's to be done? People will talk. There's no preventing it. Why, it was but yesterday I had been told Miss Gadabout had eloped with Sir Filigree Flirt. But, Lord, there's no minding what one hears. Though, to be sure, I have this from very good authority. Such reports are highly scandalous. So they are, child. Shameful, shameful. But the world is so censorious. No character escapes. Lord, now who would have suspected your friend, Miss Prim, of an indiscretion? Yet such is the ill nature of people, they say her uncle stopped her last week, just as she was stepping into the York diligence with her dancing master. I'll answer for it. There are no grounds for that report. Ah, no foundation in the world, I dare swear. 
no more probably than for the story circulated last month of miss festino's affair with colonel cassino though to be sure that matter was never rightly cleared up the license of invention some people take is monstrous indeed tis so but in my opinion those who report such things are equally culpable to be sure they are tale-bearers are as bad as the tale-makers it is an old observation and a very true one but what's to be done as i said before how will you prevent people from talking to-day mrs clackett assured me mr and mrs honeymoon were at last become mere man and wife like the rest of their acquaintance she likewise hinted that a certain widow in the next street had got rid of her dropsy and recovered her shape in a most surprising manner and at the same time miss tattle who was by affirmed that lord buffalo had discovered his lady at a house of no extraordinary fame and that sir h bouquet and tom staunter were to measure swords on a similar provocation but lord do you think i would report these things no no tale-bearers as i said before are just as bad as the tale-makers ah oh, mrs candour if everybody had your forbearance and good nature i confess mr surface i cannot bear to hear people attacked behind their backs and when ugly circumstances come out against our acquaintance i own i always love to think the best by the by i hope it's not true your brother is absolutely ruined i am afraid his circumstances are very bad indeed ma'am ah i heard so but you must tell him to keep up his spirits every one is almost in the same way lord spindle sir thomas splint captain quince mr nickett all up i hear within this week so if charles is undone he'll find half his acquaintance ruined too and that you know is consolation mm, doubtless ma'am a very great one enter servant mr crabtree and sir benjamin backbite exit servant so maria you see your lover pursues you positively you shan't escape enter crabtree and sir benjamin backbite lady sneerwell i kiss your hand mrs candour i don't believe you are acquainted with my nephew sir benjamin backbite egad ma'am he has a pretty wit and is a pretty poet too ain't he lady sneerwell oh fie uncle nay egad it's true i back him at a rebus or a charade against the best rhymer in the kingdom has your ladyship heard the epigram he wrote last week on lady frizzle's feather catching fire do benjamin repeat it or the charade you made last night extempore at mrs drowsy's conversazione come now your first is the name of a fish your second a great naval commander and uncle now prithee he faith ma'am twould surprise you to hear how ready he is at all these fine sorts of things i wonder sir benjamin you never publish anything to say truth ma'am tis very vulgar to print and as my little productions are mostly satires and lampoons on particular people i find they circulate more by giving copies in confidence to the friends of the parties however i have some love elegies which when favoured with this lady's smiles i mean to give the public for heaven ma'am they'll immortalise you you will be handed down to posterity like petrarch's laura or waller's saturisa yes madam i think you will like them when you shall see them on a beautiful quarto page where a neat rivulet of text shall meander through a meadow of margin for gad they will be the most elegant things of their kind but ladies that's true have you heard the news what sir do you mean the report of no ma'am that's not it miss nicely is going to be married to her own footman impossible ask sir benjamin tis very true ma'am everything is fixed and the wedding liveries bespoke yes and they do say that there were pressing reasons for it why i have heard something of this before it can't be and i wonder any one should believe such a story of so prudent a lady as miss nicely oh love ma'am that's the very reason twas believed at once she has always been so cautious and so reserved that everybody was sure 
there was some reason for it at bottom why to be sure a tale of scandal is as fatal to the credit of a prudent young lady of her stamp as fever is generally to those of the strongest constitutions but there is a sort of puny sickly reputation that is always ailing yet will outlive the robuster characters of a hundred prudes true madam there are valetudinarians in reputation as well as constitution who being conscious of their weak part avoid the least breath of air and supply their want of stamina by care and circumspection well but this may all be a mistake you know sir benjamin very trifling circumstances often give rise to the most injurious tales that they do i'll be sworn ma'am did you ever hear how mrs piper came to lose her lover and her character last summer at tunbridge sir benjamin you remember it oh to be sure the most whimsical circumstance how was it pray why one evening at mrs ponto's assembly the conversation happened to turn on the breeding of nova scotia sheep in this country says a young lady in company i have known instances of it for miss letitia piper a first cousin of mine had a nova scotia sheep that produced her twins what cries the lady dowager dundizzy who as you know is as deaf as a post has miss piper had twins this mistake as you imagine threw the whole company into a fit of laughter however twas the next morning everywhere reported and in a few days believed by the whole town that miss letitia piper had actually been brought to bed of a fine boy and a girl and in less than a week there were some people who could name the father and the farmhouse where the babies were put to nurse strange indeed matter of fact i assure you oh lud mr surface is it true that your uncle sir oliver is coming home oh, not that i know of indeed sir he has been in the east indies a long time you can scarcely remember him i believe sad comfort whenever he returns to hear how your brother has gone on charles has been imprudent sir to be sure but i hope no busy people have already prejudiced sir oliver against him he may reform to be sure he may for my part i never believed him to be so utterly void of principle as people say and though he has lost all his friends i am told nobody is better spoken of by the jews that's true egad nephew if the old jury was a ward i believe charles would be an alderman no man more popular therefore gad i hear he pays as many annuities as the irish tontine and that whenever he is sick they have prayers for the recovery of his health in all the synagogues yet no man lives in greater splendour they tell me when he entertains his friends he will sit down to dinner with a dozen of his own securities have a score of tradesmen waiting in the antechamber and an officer behind every guest's chair <laughs> this may be entertainment to you gentlemen but you pay very little regard to the feelings of a brother their malice is intolerable lady sneerwell i must wish you a good morning i'm not very well exit maria oh dear she changes colour very much do mrs candor follow her she may want assistance that i will with all my soul ma'am poor dear girl who knows what her situation may be exit mrs candor twas nothing but that she could not bear to hear charles reflected on notwithstanding their difference the young lady's penchant is obvious but benjamin you must not give up the pursuit for that follow her put her into good humour repeat her some of your own verses come i'll assist you mr surface i did not mean to hurt you but depend on it your brother is utterly undone oh lud i undone as ever man was can't raise a guinea and everything sold i'm told that was movable i have seen one that was at his house not a thing left but some empty bottles that were overlooked and the family pictures which i believe are framed in the wainscots and i'm very sorry also to hear some bad stories against him going oh he has done many mean things that's certain but however 
as he's your brother going we'll tell you all another opportunity exit crabtree and sir benjamin ha <laughs> ha tis very hard for them to leave a subject they have not quite run down and i believe the abuse was no more acceptable to your ladyship than maria i doubt her affections are farther engaged than we imagine but the family are to be here this evening, so you may as well dine where you are, and we shall have an opportunity of observing farther. In the meantime, I'll go and plot mischief, and you shall study sentiment. Exeunt. Scene two. Sir Peter's house. Enter Sir Peter. When an old bachelor marries a young wife, what is he to expect? "'Tis now six months since Lady Teasel made me the happiest of men, "'and I have been the most miserable dog ever since. "'We tifted a little going to church, "'and fairly quarrelled before the bells had done ringing. "'I was more than once nearly choked with a girl during the honeymoon, "'and had lost all the comfort in life before my friends had done wishing me joy. "'Yet I chose with caution. "'A girl, bred wholly in the country, who never knew luxury beyond one silk gown, nor dissipation above the annual gala of a race ball. Yet now she plays her part in all the extravagant fopperies of the fashion and the town, as if she had never seen a bush or a grass plot out of Grosvenor Square. I am sneered at by all my acquaintance, and paragraphed in the newspapers. She dissipates my fortune, and contradicts all my humours. Yet the worst of it is, I doubt I love her, or I should never bear all this. However, I'll never be weak enough to earn it. Enter Rowley. Oh, Sir Peter, your servant. How is it with you, sir? Very bad, Master Rowley, very bad. I meet with nothing but crosses and vexations. What can have happened to trouble you since yesterday? A good question to a married man. Nay, I'm sure your lady, Sir Peter, can't be the cause of your uneasiness. Why? Has anyone told you she was dead? Uh, come, come, Sir Peter. You love her. Notwithstanding, your tempers don't exactly agree. But the fault is entirely hers, Master Rowley. I am, myself, the sweetest tempered man alive and hate a teasing temper and so i tell her a hundred times a day indeed ay and what is very extraordinary in all our disputes she is always in the wrong but lady snarewell and the set she meets in her house encourage the perverseness of her disposition then to complete my vexation maria my ward whom i ought to have the power over is determined to turn rebel too, and absolutely refuses the man whom I have long resolved on for her husband, meaning, I suppose, to bestow herself on his profligate brother. You know, Sir Peter, I have always taken the liberty to differ with you on the subject of these two gentlemen. I only wish you may not be deceived in your opinion of the elder. For Charles, my life on it, he will retrieve his heirs yet. Their worthy father, once my honoured master, was, at his years, nearly as wild a spark. Yet when he died, he did not leave a more benevolent heart to lament his loss. You are wrong, Master Rowley. On their father's death, you know, I acted as a kind of guardian to them both till their uncle, Sir Oliver's liberality, gave them an early independence. Of course, no person could have more opportunities of judging of their hearts, and I was never mistaken in my life. Joseph is indeed a model for the young men of the age. He is a man of sentiment, and acts up to the sentiments he professes. But for the other, take my word for it, if he had any grain of virtue by descent, he has dissipated it with the rest of his inheritance. Ah, oh, my old friend Sir Oliver will be deeply mortified when he finds out how part of his bounty has been misapplied. I am sorry to find you so violent against the young man. 
because this may be the most critical period of his fortune i came hither with news that uh, will surprise you what let me hear uh, sir oliver is arrived and at this moment in town how you astonish me i thought you did not expect him this month i did not but his passage has been remarkably quick egad i shall rejoice to see my old friend tis fifteen years since we met we have had many a day together but does he still enjoin us not to inform his nephews of his arrival most strictly he means before it is known to make some trial of their dispositions ah there needs no art to discover their merits he shall have his way but pray does he know i am married yes and will soon wish you joy what as we drink health to a friend in a consumption ah oliver will laugh at me we used to rail at matrimony together and he has been steady to his text well he must be soon at my house though i'll instantly give orders for his reception but master rowley don't drop a word that lady teasel and i ever disagree by no means for i should never be able to stand noll's jokes so i'd have him think lord forgive me that we are a very happy couple i understand you but then you must be very careful not to differ while he is in the house with you egad and so we must and that's impossible ah master rowley when an old bachelor marries a young wife he deserves no the crime carries its punishment along with it exeunt end of act one act two scene one enter sir peter and lady teasel lady teasel lady teasel i'll not bear it sir peter sir peter you may bear it or not as you please but i ought to have my own way in everything and what's more i will too what though i was educated in the country i know very well that women of fashion in london are accountable to nobody after they are married very well ma'am very well so a husband is to have no influence no authority authority no to be sure if you wanted authority over me you should have adopted me and not married me i am sure you were old enough old enough ay there it is well well lady teasel though my life may be made unhappy by your temper i'll not be ruined by your extravagance my extravagance i'm sure i'm not more extravagant than a woman of fashion ought to be no no madam you shall throw away no more sums on such unmeaning luxury life to spend as much to furnish your dressing-room with flowers in winter as would suffice to turn the pantheon into a greenhouse and to give a fete champetre at christmas and am i to blame sir peter because flowers are dear in cold weather you should find fault with the climate and not with me for my part i'm sure i wish it was spring all the year round and that roses grew under our feet owns madam if you had been born to this i should not wonder you are talking thus but you forget what your situation was when i married you no no i don't twas a very disagreeable one or i should never have married you yes yes madam you were there in somewhat a humbler style the daughter of a plain country squire recollect lady teasel when i saw you first sitting at your tambour in a pretty figured linen gown with a bunch of keys at your side your hair combed smooth over a roll and your apartment hung round with fruits in worsted of your own working oh yes i remember it very well and a curious life i led my daily occupation to inspect the dairy superintend the poultry make extracts from the family recipe book and comb my aunt deborah's lap-dog yes yes ma'am twas so indeed and then you know my evening amusements 
to draw patterns for ruffles, which I had not materials to make up, to play Pope Joan with the curate, to read a sermon to my aunt, or to be stuck down to an old spinet to strum my father to sleep after a fox-chase. I am glad you have so good a memory. Yes, madam, these were the recreations I took you from. But now you must have your coach, Rieri, and three powdered footmen before your chair, and in the summer a pair of white cats to draw you to Kensington Gardens. No recollection, I suppose, when you were content to ride double behind the butler on a docked coach-horse? No, I swear I never did that. I deny the butler and the coach-horse. This, madam, was your situation. And what have I done for you? I have made you a woman of fashion, of fortune, of rank. In short, I have made you my wife. Well, then, and there is but one thing more you can make me to add to the obligation, and that is— My widow, I suppose. <clears throat> I thank you, madam, but don't flatter yourself. For though your ill-conduct may disturb my peace, it shall never break my heart, I promise you. However, I am equally obliged to you for the hint. Then why will you endeavour to make yourself so disagreeable to me, and to thwart me in every little elegant expense? Slife, madam, I say, had you any of these little elegant expenses when you married me? Lud, Sir Peter, would you have me be out of the fashion? The fashion, indeed! What had you to do with the fashion before you married me? For my part, I should think you would like to have your wife thought a woman of taste. Ay, there again, taste. Zounds, madam, you had no taste when you married me. That's very true indeed, Sir Peter. And after having married you, I should never pretend to taste again, I allow. But now, Sir Peter, if we have finished our daily jangle, I presume I may go to my engagement at Lady Sneerwell's. Ay, there's another precious circumstance, a charming set of acquaintance you have made there. Nay, Sir Peter, they are all people of rank and fortune, and remarkably tenacious of reputation. Yes, egad, they are tenacious of reputation with a vengeance. They don't choose anybody should have a character but themselves. Such a crew! Ah, oh, many a wretch has rid on a hurdle who has done less mischief than these utterers of forged tales, coiners of scandal, and clippers of reputation. What? Would you restrain the freedom of speech? Ah, oh, they have made you just as bad as any one of their society. Why, I believe I do bear a part with a tolerable grace but I vow I bear no malice against the people I abuse. When I say an ill-natured thing, tis out of pure good humour, and I take it for granted they deal exactly in the same manner with me. But, Sir Peter, you know you promised to come to Lady Sneerwell's too. Well, well, I'll call in just to look after my own character. Then, indeed, you must make haste after me, or you'll be too late. So good-bye to ye. Exit Lady Teasel. So I have gained much by my intended expostulation. Yet with what a charming air she contradicts everything I say, and how pleasingly she shows her contempt for my authority. Well, though I can't make her love me, there is great satisfaction in quarrelling with her, and I think she never appears to such advantage as when she is doing everything in her power to plague me. Exit. Scene two at Lady Sneerwell's. Lady Sneerwell, Mrs. Candor, Crabtree, Sir Benjamin Backbite, and Joseph Surface discovered. Nay, positively we will hear it. Yes, yes, the epigram, by all means. Oh, plague on it, uncle. Tis mere nonsense. No, no, foregad, very clever for an extempore. But, ladies, you should be acquainted with the circumstances. You must know that one day last week, as Lady Betty Curricle was taking the dust in Hyde Park, in a sort of duodecimal phaeton, she desired me to write some verses on her ponies, upon which I took out my pocket-book, and in one moment produced the following. 
Sure never were seen two such beautiful ponies. Other horses are clowns, but these macaronis. To give them this title, I'm sure can't be wrong. Their legs are so slim, and their tails are so long. There, ladies, done in the smack of a whip, and on horseback too. A very Phoebus mounted indeed, Sir Benjamin. Oh, it is, sir, trifles, trifles. Enter Lady Teasel and Maria. I must have a copy. Lady Teasel, I hope we shall see Sir Peter. I believe he'll wait on your ladyship presently. Maria, my love, you look grave. Come, you shall set down to piquet with Mr. Surface. I take very little pleasure in cards. However, I'll do as you please. Aside. I am surprised Mr. Surface should sit down with her. I thought he would have embraced this opportunity of speaking to me, before Sir Peter came. Now I'll die, but you are so scandalous, I'll forswear your society. What's the matter, Mrs. Candor? They'll not allow our friend, Miss Vermilion, to be handsome. Oh, surely she is a pretty woman. I am very glad you think so, ma'am. She has a charming fresh colour. Yes, when it is fresh put on. Oh, fie, I swear her colour's natural. I have seen it come and go. I dare swear you have, ma'am. It goes off at night and comes again in the morning. True, ma'am. It not only comes and goes, but what's more, egad, her maid can fetch and carry it. Ha, ha, ha. How I hate to hear you talk so. But surely now her sister is, or was, very handsome. Who? Mrs. Evergreen? Oh, Lord, she's six and fifty if she's an hour. Now, positively you wrong her. Fifty-two or fifty-three is the utmost, and I don't think she looks more. Ah, there's no judging by her looks, unless one could see her face. Well, well, if Mrs. Evergreen does take some pains to repair the ravages of time, you must allow she affects it with great ingenuity. And surely that's better than the careless manner in which the widow Ochre chalks her wrinkles. Nay, now, Lady Sneerwell, you are severe upon the widow. Come, come, tis not that she paints so ill, but when she has finished her face, she joins it so badly to her neck that she looks like a mended statue, in which the connoisseur sees at once that the head's modern, though the trunk's antique. Ha, ha, ha! Well said, nephew. Ha, <laughs> ha! Well, you make me laugh, but I vow I hate you for it. What do you think of Miss Simper? Why, she has very pretty teeth. Yes, and on that account, when she is neither speaking nor laughing, which very seldom happens, she never absolutely shuts her mouth, but leaves it always on a jar, as it were, thus shows her teeth. How can you be so ill-natured? Nay, I allow even that's better than the pains Mrs. Prim takes to conceal her losses in front. She draws her mouth till it positively resembles the aperture of a pause box, and all her words appear to slide out edgewise, as it were thus. How do you do, madam? Yes, madam. Very well, Lady Teasel. I see you can be a little severe. In defence of a friend, it is but justice. But here comes Sir Peter to spoil our pleasantry. Enter Sir Peter Teasel. Ladies, you're most obedient. Aside. Mercy on me, here is the whole set, a character dead at every word, I suppose. I am rejoiced you are come, Sir Peter. They have been so censorious, and Lady Teasel as bad as any one. It must be very distressing to you, Mrs. Candor, I dare say. Oh, they will allow good qualities to nobody, not even good nature to our friend Mrs. Percy. What, the fat dowager who was at Mrs. Quadrille's last night? Nay, her bulk is her misfortune, and when she takes such pains to get rid of it, you ought not to reflect on her. That's very true indeed. Yes, I know she almost lives on acids and small whey, laces herself by pulleys, and often in the hottest noon in summer you may see her on a little squat pony, with her hair plaited up behind like a drummer's, and puffing round the ring on a full trot. I thank you, Lady Teasel, for defending her. Yes, a good defence, truly. Truly, Lady Teasel is as censorious as Miss Sallow. Yes, and she is a curious being to pretend to be censorious, an awkward gawky, without any one good point under heaven. 
positively you shall not be so very severe miss sallow is a near relation of mine by marriage and as for her person great allowance is to be made for let me tell you a woman labours under many disadvantages who tries to pass for a girl at six-and-thirty though surely she is handsome still and for the weakness in her eyes considering how much she reads by candlelight it is not to be wondered at true and then as to her manner upon my word i think it is particularly graceful considering she never had the least education for you know her mother was a welsh milliner and her father a sugar-baker at bristol ah you are both of you too good-natured aside yes damned good-natured this the own relation mercy on me for my part i own i cannot bear to hear a friend ill spoken of no to be sure oh you are of a moral turn mrs candor and i consider an hour and hear lady stucco talk sentiment nay i vow lady stucco is very well with the dessert after dinner for she's just like the french fruits one cracks for mottoes made up of paint and proverb well i will never join in ridiculing a friend and so constantly i tell my cousin ogle and you all know what pretensions she has to be critical on beauty oh to be sure she has herself the oddest countenance that ever was seen tis a collection of features from all the different countries of the globe so she has indeed an irish front caledonian locks dutch nose austrian lips complexion of a spaniard and teeth a la chinoise in short her face resembles a table d'hote at spa where no two guests are of a nation or a congress at the close of a general war wherein all the members even to her eyes appear to have a different interest and her nose and chin are the only parties likely to join issue ha <laughs> ha aside mercy on my life a person they dine with twice a week go go you are a couple of provoking toads nay but i vow you shall not carry the laugh off so well give me leave to say that mrs ogle madam madam i beg your pardon there's no stopping these good gentlemen's tongues but when i tell you mrs candor that the lady they are abusing is a particular friend of mine i hope you'll not take her part <laughs> well said sir peter but you are a cruel creature too phlegmatic yourself for a jest and too peevish to allow wit in others ah madam true wit is nearly more allied to good nature than your ladyship is aware of true sir peter i believe they are so near akin that they never can be united or rather madam suppose them to be man and wife because one seldom sees them together but sir peter is such an enemy to scandal i believe he would have it put down by parliament for oh, heaven madam if they were to consider the sporting with reputation of such importance as poaching on manners and pass an act for the preservation of fame i believe there are many would thank them for the bill oh lord sir peter would you deprive us of our privileges ay madam and then no person should be permitted to kill characters and run down reputations but qualified old maids and disappointed widows go you monster but surely you would not be quite so severe on those who only report what they hear yes madam i would have law merchant for them too and in all cases of slander currency whenever the drawer of the lie was not to be found the injured party should have a right to come on any of the endorsers well for my part i believe there never was a scandalous tale without some foundation oh nine out of ten of the malicious inventions are founded on some ridiculous misrepresentation come ladies shall we sit down to cards in the next room enter a servant who whispers sir peter apart i'll be with them directly i'll get away unperceived sir peter you are not going to leave us your ladyship must excuse me i'm called away by particular business but i leave my character behind me exit sir peter well certainly lady teasel that lord of yours is a strange being 
I could tell you some stories of him would make you laugh heartily, if he were not your husband. Oh, pray, don't mind that. Come, do let's hear them. Joins the rest of the company, going into the next room. Maria, I see you have no satisfaction in this society. How is it possible I should? If to raise malicious smiles at the infirmities or misfortunes of those who have never injured us be the province of wit and humour, heaven grant me a double portion of dullness. Yet they appear more ill-natured than they are. They have no malice at heart. Then is their conduct still more contemptible? For, in my opinion, nothing could excuse the interference of their tongues but a natural, uncontrollable bitterness of mind. Undoubtedly, madam. And it has always been a sentiment of mind that to propagate a malicious truth wantonly is more despicable than to falsify from revenge. But can you, Maria, feel thus for others, and be unkind to me alone? Is a hope to be denied the tenderest passion? Why will you distress me in renewing the subject? Ah, oh, Maria, you would not treat me thus and oppose your guardian Sir Peter's will. But then I see that profligate Charles is still a favoured rival. Ungenerously urged. But whatever my sentiments are for that unfortunate young man, be assured I shall not feel more bound to give him up, because his distresses have lost him the regard of even his brother. Nay, but Maria, do not leave me with a frown. By all that's honest, I swear. Kneels. Re-enter Lady Teasel behind. Aside. Gad's life, he is Lady Teasel. Aloud to Maria. You must not. No, you shall not. For though I have the greatest regard for Lady Teasel. Lady Teasel? Yet were Sir Peter to suspect. Coming forward. What is this, pray? Do you take her for me? Child, you are wanted in the next room. Exit Maria. What is all this, pray? Oh, the most unlucky circumstance in nature. Maria has somehow suspected that tender concern I had for your happiness, and threatened to acquaint Sir Peter with her suspicions, and I was just endeavouring to reason with her when you came in. Indeed? But you seemed to adopt a very tender mode of reasoning. Do you usually argue on your knees? Oh, she's a child, and I thought a little bombast. <laughs> but, Lady Teasel, when are you going to give me your judgment on my library, as you promised? No, no. I begin to think it would be imprudent. And you know, I admit to you as a lover no farther than fashion sanctions. True, a more platonic Cicispio, what every wife is entitled to. Certainly, one must not be out of the fashion. However, I have so much of my country prejudices left that though Sir Peter's ill humour may vex me ever so, it shall never provoke me to— The only revenge in your power? Well, I applaud your moderation. Go. You are an insinuating wretch. But we shall be missed. Let us join the company. But we had best not return together. Well, don't stay, for Maria shan't come to hear any more of your reasoning, I promise you. Exit Lady Teasel. A curious dilemma my politics have run me into. I wanted at first only to ingratiate myself with Lady Teasel, that she might not be my enemy with Maria, and I have, I, I don't know how, become her serious lover. Sincerely, I begin to wish I had never made such a point of gaining so very good a character, for it has led me to so many cursed rogueries that I, I doubt I shall be exposed at last. Huh. Exit. Scene three. Sir Peter Teasels. Enter Rowley and Sir Oliver Surface. Ha 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 ha. So my old friend is married, eh? A young wife out of the country. Ha 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 ha. That he should have stood bluff to old bachelor so long, and sink into a husband at last. But you must not rally him on the subject, Sir Oliver. It is a tender point, I assure you. Though he has been married only seven months. Then he has been just half a year on the stool of repentance. Poor Peter. But you say he has entirely given up Charles? Never sees him, eh? His prejudice against him is astonishing, and I am sure greatly increased by a jealousy of him with Lady Teasel, which he has industriously been led into by a scandalous society in the neighborhood, who have contributed not a little to Charles's ill name. 
whereas the truth is i believe if the lady is partial to either of them his brother is the favorite i i know there is a set of malicious prating prudent gossips both male and female who murder characters to kill time and will rob a young fellow of his good name before he has years to know the value of it but i am not to be prejudiced against my nephew by such i promise you no no if charles has done nothing false or mean i shall compound for his extravagance ah then my life on it you will reclaim him ah sir it gives me new life to find that your heart is not turned against him and that the son of my good old master has one friend however left what shall i forget master rowley when i was his age myself egad my brother and i were neither of us very prudent youths and yet i believe you have not seen many better men than your old master was sir it is this reflection gives me assurance that charles may yet be a credit to his family but here comes sir peter egad so he does mercy on me he's greatly altered and seems to have a settled married look one may read husband in his face at this distance enter sir peter teasel ah oh, sir oliver my old friend welcome to england a thousand times thank you thank you sir peter and in faith i am glad to find you well believe me oh tis a long time since we met fifteen years i doubt sir oliver and many a cross accident in the time i i have had my share but what i find you are married hey well well it can't be helped and so i wish you joy with all my heart thank you thank you sir oliver yes i've entered into the happy state but we'll not talk of that now true true sir peter old friends should not begin on grievances at first meeting no 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 take care pray sir well so one of my nephews is a wild fellow eh wild ah my old friend i grieve for your disappointment there he's a lost young man indeed however his brother will make you amends joseph is indeed what a youth should be everybody in the world speaks well of him i am sorry to hear it he has too good a character to be an honest fellow everybody speaks well of him pshaw then he has bowed as low to knaves and fools as to the honest dignity of genius and virtue what sir oliver do you blame him for not making enemies yes if he has merit enough to deserve them well well you'll be convinced when you know him there's edification to hear him converse he professes the noblest sentiments oh plague of his sentiments if he salutes me with a scrap of morality in his mouth i shall be sick directly but however don't mistake me sir peter i don't mean to defend charles's errors but before i form my judgment i intend to make a trial of their hearts and my friend rowley and i have planned something for the purpose and sir peter shall own for once he has been mistaken oh my life on joseph's honour well come give us a bottle of good wine and we'll drink the lad's health and tell you our scheme Allons, then and don't sir peter be so severe against your old friend's son odds my life i am not sorry that he has run out of the course a little for my part i hate to see prudence clinging to the green suckers of youth tis like ivy round a sapling and spoils the growth of the tree Exeunt. End of Act Two. Act Three, Scene One, Sir Peter Teasel's. Enter Sir Peter Teasel, Sir Oliver Surface, and Rowley. Well then, we will see this fellow first and have our wine afterwards. But how is this, Master Rowley? I don't see the jet of your scheme. Why, sir, this Mister Stanley, who I was speaking of is nearly related to them by their mother he was a merchant in dublin but has been ruined by a series of undeserved misfortunes he has applied by letter to mr surface and charles from the former he has received 
nothing but evasive promises of future service while charles has done all that his extravagance has left him power to do and he is at this time endeavouring to raise a sum of money part of which in the midst of his own distresses i know he intends for the service of poor stanley ah he is my brother's son well but how is sir oliver personally to why sir i will inform charles and his brother that stanley has obtained permission to apply personally to his friends and as they have neither of them ever seen him let sir oliver assume his character and he will have a fair opportunity of judging at least of the benevolence of their dispositions and believe me sir you will find in the youngest brother one who in the midst of folly and dissipation has still as our immortal bard expresses it a heart to pity and a hand open as day for melting charity pshaw what signifies his having an open hand or purse either when he has nothing left to give well well make the trial if you please but where is the fellow whom you brought for sir oliver to examine relative to charles affairs below waiting his commands and no one can give him better intelligence this sir oliver is a friendly jew who to do him justice has done everything in his power to bring your nephew to a proper sense of his extravagance pray let us have him in apart to servant desire sir moses to walk upstairs but pray why do you suppose he will speak the truth oh i have convinced him that he has no chance of recovering certain sums advanced to charles but through the bounty of sir oliver who he knows is arrived so that you may depend on his fidelity to his own interests i have also another evidence in my power one snake whom i have detected in a matter little short of forgery and shall speedily produce him to remove some of your prejudices i have heard too much on that subject here comes the honest israelite enter moses this is sir oliver sir i understand you have lately had great dealings with my nephew charles yes sir oliver i have done all i could for him but he was ruined before he came to me for assistance that was unlucky truly for you have had no opportunity of showing your talents not at all i hadn't the pleasure of knowing his distresses till he was some thousands worse than nothing unfortunate indeed but i suppose you have done all in your power for him honest moses yes he knows that this very evening i was to have brought him a gentleman from the city who does not know him and will i believe advance him some money what one child has never had money from before yes mr premium of crutched friars formerly a broker egad sir oliver a thought strikes me charles you say does not know mr premium not at all now then sir oliver you may have a better opportunity of satisfying yourself than by an old romancing tale of a poor relation go with my friend moses and represent premium and then i'll answer for it you'll see your nephew in all his glory egad i like this idea better than the other and i may visit joseph afterwards as old stanley true so you may well this is taking charles rather at a, a disadvantage to be sure however moses you understand sir peter and will be faithful you may depend upon me this is near the time i was to have gone i'll accompany you as soon as you please moses but hold i have forgotten one thing how the plague shall i be able to pass for a jew there's no need the principal is christian is he i'm very sorry to hear it but then again ain't i rather too smartly dressed to look like a money lender not at all twould not be out of character if you went in your own carriage would it moses not in the least well but how must i talk there's certainly some cant of usury 
and mode of treating that I ought to know? Oh, there's not much to learn. The great point, as I take it, is to be exorbitant enough in your demands. Eh, Moses? Yes, that's a very great point. I'll answer for it. I'll not be wanting in that. I'll ask him eight or ten per cent, on the loan at least. If you ask him no more than that, you'll be discovered immediately. Hey, what the plague? How much then? That depends upon the circumstances. If he appears not very anxious for the supply, you should require only forty or fifty per cent. But if you find him in great distress and want the monies very bad, you may ask double. A good honest trade you're learning, Sir Oliver. Truly, I think so, and not unprofitable. Then, you know, you haven't the monies yourself, but are forced to borrow them for him of an old friend. Oh, I borrow it of a friend, do I? And your friend is an unconscionable dog, but you can't help that. My friend's an unconscionable dog? Yes, and he himself has not the monies by him, but is forced to sell stock at a great loss. He is forced to sell stock at a great loss, is he? Well, that's very kind of him. E faith, Sir Oliver, Mr. Premium, I mean. You'll soon be master of the trade. But, Moses, would you not have him run out a little against the annuity bill? That would be in character, I should think. Very much. And lament that a young man now must be at years of discretion before he is suffered to ruin himself. Aye, great pity. And abuse the public for allowing merit to an act whose only object is to snatch misfortune and imprudence from the rapacious gripe of usury, and give the miner a chance of inheriting his estate without being undone by coming into possession. So, so. Moses shall give me further instructions as we go together. You will not have much time, for your nephew lives hard by. Oh, never fear. My tutor appears so able, that though Charles lived in the next street, it must be my own fault if I am not a complete rogue before I turn the corner. Exeunt Sir Oliver Surface and Moses. Sir, now, I think Sir Oliver will be convinced. You are partial, really, and would have prepared Charles for the other plot? No, upon my word, Sir Peter. Well, go bring me this snake, and I'll hear what he has to say presently. I see Maria, and want to speak with her. Exit Rowley. I should be glad to be convinced my suspicions of Lady Teasel and Charles were unjust. I have never opened my mind on this subject to my friend Joseph. I am determined I will do it. He will give me his opinion sincerely. Enter Maria. So, child, has Mr. Surface returned with you? No, sir, he was engaged. Well, Maria, do you not reflect the more you converse with that amiable young man? What return his partiality for you deserves? Indeed, Sir Peter, your infrequent importunity on this subject distresses me extremely. You compel me to declare that I know no man who has ever paid me a particular attention, whom I would not prefer to Mr. Surface. So, here's perverseness. No, no, Maria, tis Charles only whom you should prefer. Tis evident his vices and follies have won your heart. This is unkind, sir. You know I have obeyed you in neither seeing nor corresponding with him. I have heard enough to convince me that he is unworthy of my regard. Yet I cannot think it culpable if, while my understanding severely condemns his voice, my heart suggests some pity for his distresses. Well, well, pity him as much as you please, but give your heart and hand to a worthier object. Never to his brother. Go, perverse and obstinate. But take care, madam. You have never yet known what the authority of a guardian is. Don't compel me to inform you of it. I can only say, you shall not have just reason. Tis true, by my father's will, I am for some short period bound to regard you as his substitutes, but must cease to think of you as so when you would compel me to be miserable. Exit, Maria. Was ever man so crossed as I am? Everything conspiring to fret me. I had not been involved in matrimony a fortnight before her father, a hale and hearty man, died, on purpose, I believe, for the pleasure of plaguing me with the care of his daughter. But here comes my helpmate. She appears in great good humour. 
how happy i should be if i could tease her into loving me though but a little enter lady teasel lud sir peter i hope you haven't been quarrelling with maria it is not using me well to be ill-humoured but i am not by ah lady teasel you might have the power to make me good-humoured at all times i am sure i wish i had for i want you to be in a charming sweet temper at this moment do be good-humoured now and let me have two hundred pounds will you two hundred pounds what and i to be in a good humour without paying for it but speak to me thus and he faith there's nothing i could refuse you you shall have it but seal me a bond for the repayment oh no there my note of hand will do as well offering her hand and you shall no longer reproach me with not giving you an independent settlement i mean shortly to surprise you but shall we always live thus hey if you please i'm sure i don't care how soon we leave off quarrelling provided you'll own you were tired first well then let our future contest be who shall be the most obliging i assure you sir peter good nature becomes you you look now as you did before we were married when you used to walk with me under the elms and tell me stories of what a gallant you were in your youth and chuck me under the chin you would and ask me if i thought i could love an old fellow who would deny me nothing didn't you yes yes and you were as kind and attentive ay so i was and would always take your part when my acquaintance used to abuse you and turn you into ridicule indeed ay and when my cousin sophie has called you a stiff peevish old bachelor and laughed at me for thinking of marrying one who might be my father i have always defended you and said i didn't think you so ugly by any means and i dared say you'd make a very good sort of a husband and you prophesied right and we shall now be the happiest couple and never differ again no never though at the same time indeed my dear lady teasel you must watch your temper very seriously for in all our little quarrels my dear if you recollect my love you always began first i beg your pardon my dear sir peter indeed you always gave the provocation now see my angel take care contradicting isn't the way to keep friends then don't you begin it my love there now you you are going on you don't perceive my life that you are just doing the very thing which you know always makes me angry nay you know if you will be angry without any reason my dear there now you want to quarrel again no i am sure i don't but if you will be so peevish there now who begins first why you to be sure i said nothing but there's no bearing your temper no no madam the fault's in your own temper ay you were just what my cousin sophie said you would be your cousin sophie is a forward impertinent gipsy you are a great bear i'm sure to abuse my relations now may all the plagues of marriage be doubled on me if ever i try to be friends with you any more so much the better no no madam tis evident you never cared a pin for me and i was a madman to marry you a pert rural coquette that had refused half the honest squires in the neighbourhood and i am sure i was a fool to marry you an old dangling bachelor who is single at fifty only because he could never meet with any one who would have him ay ay madam but you were pleased enough to listen to me you never had such an offer before no didn't i refuse sir tivy terrier who everybody said would have been a better match for his estate is just as good as yours and he has broke his neck since we have been married i have done with you madam you are an unfeeling ungrateful but there's an end of everything i believe you capable of everything that is bad yes madam i now believe the reports relative to you and charles madam yes madam you and charles are not without grounds take care sir peter you had better not insinuate any such thing 
I'll not be suspected without cause, I promise you. Very well, madam, very well. A separate maintenance as soon as you please. Yes, madam, or a divorce. I will make an example of myself for the benefit of all old bachelors. Let us separate, madam. Agreed, agreed. And now, my dear Sir Peter, we are of a mind once more. We may be the happiest couple and never differ again, you know. <laughs> well, you are going to be in a passion, I see, and shall only interrupt you. So, bye-bye. Exit. Plagues and tortures. Can't I make her angry either? Oh, I am the most miserable fellow. But I'll not bear her presuming to keep her temper. No, she may break my heart, but she shan't keep her temper. Exit. Scene two. Charles Surface's house. Enter Trip, Moses, and Sir Oliver Surface. Here, Master Moses, if you'll stay a moment, I'll try whether. What's the gentleman's name? Mr. Premium. Premium. Very well. Exit Trip. Taking snuff. To judge by the servants, one wouldn't believe the master was ruined. But what? Sure, this was my brother's house. Yes, sir. Mr. Charles bought it of Mr. Joseph with the furniture, pictures, etc., just as the old gentleman left it. Sir Peter thought it a piece of extravagance in him. In my mind, the other's economy in selling it to him was more rehensible by half. Enter Trip. My master says you must wait, gentlemen. He has company and can't speak with you yet. If he knew who it was wanted to see him, perhaps he would not send such a message. Yes, yes, sir. He knows you are here. I did not forget little premium. No, no, no. Very well. And I pray, sir, what may be your name? Trip, sir. My name is Trip, at your service. Well then, Mr. Trip, you have a pleasant sort of place here, I guess. Why, yes. Here are three or four of us pass our time agreeably enough, but then our wages are sometimes a little in arrear and not very great either, but fifty pounds a year, and find our own bags and bouquets. Aside. Bags and bouquets? Halters and bastinados. And, apropos, Moses, have you been able to get me that little bill discounted? Aside. Wants to raise money, too. Mercy on me. Has his distresses, too, I warrant, like a lord, and affects creditors and duns. T'was not to be done, indeed, Mr. Tripp. Good lack, you surprise me. My friend Brush has endorsed it, and I thought when he put his name on the back of a bill, t'was the same as cash. No, it wouldn't do. A small sum, but twenty pounds. Hark ye, Moses. Do you think you couldn't get it me by way of annuity? Aside. An annuity? Ha, ha, ha! A footman raised money by way of annuity? Well done, luxury! Egad! Well, but you must insure your place. Oh, with all my heart! I'll insure my place, and my life, too, if you please. Aside. It is more than I would your neck. But is there nothing you could deposit? Why, nothing capital in my master's wardrobe has dropped lately. But I could give you a mortgage and some of his winter clothes, with equity of redemption before November, or you shall have the reversion of the French velvet, or a post bit on the blue and silver. These, I should think, Moses, with a few pair of point ruffles, as a collateral security. Hey, my little fellow. Well, well. Bell rings. Egad, I heard the bell. I believe, gentlemen, I can now introduce you. Don't forget the annuity, little Moses. This way, gentlemen, I'll ensure my place, you know. If the man be a shadow of the master, this is the temple of dissipation indeed. Exeunt. Scene three. Charles Surface, Sir Harry Bumper, careless, etc., etc., discovered at a table, with wine, etc., for heaven tis true there's the great degeneracy of the age many of our acquaintance have taste spirit and politeness but plagueant they won't drink it is so indeed charles they give in to all the substantial luxuries of the table and abstain from nothing but wine and wit oh certainly society suffers by it intolerably for now, instead of the social spirit of raillery that used to mantle over a glass of bright burgundy, their conversation has become just like the spa water they drink, which has all the pertness and flatulence of champagne, without the spirit or flavour. 
But what are they to do who love play better than wine? True. There's Sir Harry diets himself for gaming, and is now under a hazard regimen. Then he'll have the worst of it. What? You wouldn't train a horse to the course by keeping him from corn. For my part, gad, I am never so successful as when I am a little merry. Let me throw on a bottle of champagne, and I never lose. At least, I never feel my losses, which is exactly the same thing. Ay, that I believe. And then, what man can pretend to be a believer in love, who is an abjurer of wine? Tis the test by which the lover knows his own heart. Fill a dozen bumpers to a dozen beauties, and she that floats at the top is the maid that has bewitched you. Now then, Charles, be honest, and give us your real favourite. Why, I have withheld her only in compassion to you. If I toast her, you must give a round of her peers, which is impossible, on earth. No, then we'll find some canonised vestals or heathen goddesses that will do, I warrant. Here then, bumpers, you rogues, bumpers. Maria! Maria! Maria who? Oh, damn the surname. Tis too formal to be registered in love's calendar. But now, Sir Harry, beware. We must have beauty superlative. Nay, never study, Sir Harry. We'll stand to the toast, though your mistress should want an eye. And you know you have a song will excuse you. He gets so I have. And I'll give him the song instead of the lady. Here's to the maiden of bashful fifteen. Here's to the widow of fifty. Here's to the flaunting extravagant queen. And here's to the housewife that's thrifty. Let the toast pass. Drink to the lass, I'll warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass. Here's to the charmer whose dimples we prize, now to the maid who has none, sir. Here's to the girl with a pair of blue eyes, and here's to the nymph with but one, sir. Let the toast pass drink to the lass i'll warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass here's to the maid with a bosom of snow now to her that's as brown as a berry here's to the wife with a face full of woe and now to the girl that is merry let the toast pass drink to the lass i'll warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass for let em be clumsy or let em be slim young or ancient i care not a feather so fill a pint bumper quite up to the brim and let us e'en toast them together let the toast pass drink to the lass I'll warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass. Bravo! 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 Enter Trip, and whispers Charles Surface. Gentlemen, you must excuse me a little. Careless, take the chair, will you? Nay, prithee, Charles, what now? This is one of your peerless beauties, I suppose, is dropped in by chance. No, Faith, to tell you the truth, "'Tis a Jew and a broker, who are come by appointment." "'No, oh, damn it! Let's have the Jew in." "'Aye, and the broker too, by all means." "'Yes. Yes, the Jew and the broker." "'Egad, with all my heart. Trip, bid the gentlemen walk in. Though there's one of them a stranger, I can tell you." Charles, let us give them some generous burgundy, and perhaps they'll grow conscientious. Oh, hang em, no! Wine does but draw forth a man's natural qualities, and to make them drink would only be to wet their knavery. Enter Trip, Sir Oliver Surface, and Moses. So, honest Moses, walk in, pray, Mr. Premium. 
That's the gentleman's name, isn't it, Moses? Yes, sir. Set chairs, Trip. Sit down, Mr. Premium. Glasses, Trip. Sit down, Moses. Come, Mr. Premium. I'll give you a sentiment. Here's success to usury. Moses, fill the gentleman a bumper. Success to usury. Right, Moses. Usury is prudence and industry, and deserves to succeed. Then here's all the success it deserves. No, no, that won't do. Mr. Premium, you have demurred at the toast, and must drink it in a pint bumper. A pint bumper, at least. Oh, pray, sir, consider. Mr. Premium's a gentleman. And therefore loves good wine. Give Moses a court glass. This is mutiny and a high contempt for the chair. Here, now for it. I'll see justice done to the last drop of my bottle. Nay, pray, gentlemen, I did not expect this usage. No, hang it, you shan't. Mr. Premium's a stranger. Aside. Odd. I wish I was well out of their company. Plague on em, then. If they don't drink, we'll not sit down with them. Come, Harry, the dice are in the next room. Charles, you'll join us when you have finished your business with the gentlemen. I will, I will. Exeunt. Careless. Returning. Well? Perhaps I may want you. No, you know I am always ready. Word, note, or bond, tis all the same to me. Exit. Sir, this is Mr. Premium, a gentleman of the strictest honour and secrecy, and always performs what he undertakes. Mr. Premium, this is... Sir, have done. Sir, my friend Moses is a very honest fellow, but a little slow at expression. He'll be an hour giving us our titles. Mr. Premium, the plain state of the matter is this. I am an extravagant young fellow who wants to borrow money. You I take to be a prudent old fellow who have got money to lend. I am blockhead enough to give fifty per cent, sooner than not have it, and you, I presume, are rogue enough to take a hundred if you can get it. Now, sir, you see we are acquainted at once, and may proceed to business without farther ceremony. Exceeding frank, upon my word. I see, sir, you are not a man of many compliments. Oh, no, sir. Plain dealing in business I always think best. Sir, I like you the better for it. However, you are mistaken in one thing. I have no money to lend. But I believe I could procure some of a friend. But then he's an unconscionable dog, isn't he, Moses? But you can't help that. And must sell stock to accommodate you. Mustn't he, Moses? Yes, indeed. You know I always speak the truth, and scorn to tell a lie. Right. People that speak the truth generally do. But these are trifles, Mr. Premium. What? I know money isn't to be bought without paying for it. Well, but what security could you give? You have no land, I suppose. Not a molehill nor a twig, but what's in the bow-pots out of the window. Nor any stock, I presume? Nothing but livestock, and that's only a few pointers and ponies. But pray, Mr. Premium, are you acquainted at all with any of my connections? Why, to say truth, I am. Then you must know that I have a devilish rich uncle in the East Indies, Sir Oliver Surface, from whom I have the greatest expectations. That you have a wealthy uncle, I have heard. But how your expectations will turn out is more, I believe, than you can tell. Oh, no, there can be no doubt. They tell me I'm a prodigious favourite, and that he talks of leaving me everything. Indeed. This is the first I've heard of it. Yes, yes. "'Tis just so. Moses knows tis true, don't you, Moses?' "'Oh, yes. I'll swear to that.' Aside. "'Egad. Don't persuade me presently. I'm at Bengal.' "'Now I propose, Mr. Premium, if it's agreeable to you, a post-obit on Sir Oliver's life, though at the same time the old fellow has been so liberal to me that I give you my word I should be very sorry to hear that anything had happened to him.' Not more than I should, I assure you. But the bond you mention happens to be just the worst security you could offer me, for I might live to be a hundred and never see the principal. Oh, yes, you would. 
the moment sir oliver dies you know you would come on me for the money then i believe i should be the most unwelcome dun you ever had in your life what i suppose you're afraid sir oliver is too good a life no indeed i am not though i have heard he is as hale and healthy as any man of his years in christendom there again now you are misinformed no no the climate has hurt him considerably poor uncle oliver yes yes he breaks a pace i'm told and is so much altered lately that his nearest relations don't know him no <laughs> so much altered lately that his nearest relations don't know him <laughs> he gad <laughs> <laughs> You're glad to hear that, little premium. No, no, I'm not. Yes, yes, you are. <laughs> you know that mends your chance. But I'm told Sir Oliver is coming over. Nay, some say he's actually arrived. Psa! Sure I must know better than you whether he's come or not. No, no, reliant. He's at this moment at Calcutta. Isn't he, Moses? Oh, yes, certainly very true as you say you must know better than i though i have it from a pretty good authority haven't i moses yes most undoubted but sir as i understand you want a few hundreds immediately is there nothing you could dispose of how do you mean for instance now i have heard that your father left behind him a great quantity of massive old plate oh lud that's gone long ago moses can tell you how better than i can aside good lack all the family race cups and corporation bowls uh, then it was also supposed that his library was one of the most valuable and compact yes yes so it was vastly too much so for a private gentleman for my part i was always of a communicative disposition so i thought it a shame to keep so much knowledge to myself aside mercy upon me learning that had run in the family like an heirloom pray what are become of the books you must inquire of the auctioneer, Master Premium, for I don't believe even Moses can direct you. I know nothing of books. So, so, uh, nothing of the family property left, I suppose? Not much indeed. Unless you have a mind to the family pictures, I have got a room full of ancestors above, and if you have a taste for old paintings, egad, you shall have them a bargain. Hey, what the devil? Sure you wouldn't sell your forefathers, would you? every man of them to the best bidder what your great uncles and aunts ay and my great grandfathers and grandmothers too aside now i give up what the plague have you no bowels for your own kindred odds life do you take me for shylock in the play that you would raise money of me on your own flesh and blood nay my little broker don't be angry what need you care if you have your money's worth well i'll be the purchaser I think I can dispose of the family canvas. Aside. Oh, I'll never forgive him this. Never. Enter careless. Come, Charles, what keeps you? I can't come yet. If faith, we are going to have a sale above stairs. Here's little premium. We'll buy all my ancestors. Oh, burn your ancestors. No, he may do that afterwards, if he pleases. Stay careless. We want you. Egad, you shall be auctioneer. So come along with us. Oh, have with you, if that's the case. I can handle a hammer as well as a dice-box. Aside. Oh, the profligate. Come, Moses, you shall be appraiser, if we want one. Gad's life, little premium. You don't seem to like the business. Oh, yes, I do vastly. Ha, 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 Yes, yes. I think it a rare joke to sell one's family by auction. Ha, 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 ha. Aside. Oh, the prodigal. To be sure. When a man wants money, where the plague should he get assistance? If he can't make free with his own relations. Exeunt. End of Act Three. Act Four. Scene One. Picture room at Charles's. Enter Charles Surface, Sir Oliver Surface, Moses, and Careless. Walk in, gentlemen, pray walk in. Here they are, the family of the surfaces, up to the conquest. And, in my opinion, a goodly collection. Ay, ay, these are done in the true spirit of portrait painting. No volontiere grace and expression. 
not like the works of your modern Raphaels, who give you the strongest resemblance, yet contrive to make your portrait independent of you, so that you may sink the original and not hurt the picture. No, no, the merit of these is the inveterate likeness, all stiff and awkward as the originals, and like nothing in human nature besides. Ah, we shall never see such figures of men again. I hope not. Well, you see, Master Premium, what a domestic character I am. Here I sit of an evening, surrounded by my family. But come, get to your pulpit, Mr. Auctioneer. Here's an old, gouty chair of my father's will answer the purpose. Ay, ay, this will do. But, Charles, I haven't a hammer. And what's an auctioneer without his hammer? Egad, that's true. What parchment have we here? Oh, our genealogy in full. Here, careless, you shall have no common bit of mahogany. Here's the family tree for you, you rogue. This shall be your hammer. And now you may knock down my ancestors with their own pedigree. Aside. What an unnatural rogue. An ex post facto parricide. Yes, yes, here's a bit of your generation indeed. Faith, Charles, this is the most convenient thing you could have found for the business, for it will serve not only as a hammer, but a catalogue into the bargain. Come, begin. A-going, a-going, a-going. Bravo, careless. Well, here's my great-uncle, Sir Richard Raveline, a marvellous good general in his day, I assure you. He served in all the Duke of Marlborough's wars, and got that cut over his eye at the Battle of Malplaquet. What say you, Mr. Premium? Look at him. There's a hero. Not cut out of his feathers, as your modern clipped captains are, but enveloped in wig and regimentals, as a general should be. What do you bid? Mr. Premium would have you speak. Why, then, he shall have him for ten pounds. And I'm sure that's not dear for a staff officer. Aside. Heaven deliver me! His famous Uncle Richard for ten pounds? Well, sir, I take him at that. Careless, knock down my Uncle Richard. Here now is a maiden sister of his, my great-aunt Deborah, done by Neller, thought to be in his best manner, and a very formidable likeness. There she is, you see, a shepherdess feeding her flock. You shall have her for five pounds ten. The sheep are worth the money. Aside. Ah, poor Deborah, a woman who set such a value on herself. Five pounds ten, she's mine. Knock down my Aunt Deborah. Here now are two that were a sort of cousins of theirs. You see, Moses, these pictures were done some time ago, when Beau wore wigs and the ladies their own hair. Yes, truly. Headdresses appear to have been a little lower in those days. Well, take that couple for the same. Tis a good bargain. Careless. This now is the grandfather of my mother's, a learned judge well known on the western circuit. What do you rate him at, Moses? Four guineas. Four guineas? Gad's life, you don't bid me the price of his wig. Mr. Premium, you have more respect for the woolsack. Do let us knock his lordship down at fifteen. By all means. Gone. And there are two brothers of his, William and Walter Blunt, esquires both members of Parliament, and noted speakers. And what's very extraordinary, I believe, this is the first time they were ever bought or sold. That is very extraordinary indeed. I'll take them at your own price for the honour of Parliament. Well said, little premium. I'll knock em down at forty. Here's a jolly fellow. I don't know what relation, but he was mayor of Norwich. Take him at eight pounds. No, no. Six will do for the mare. Come, make it guineas, and I'll throw you the two aldermen there into the bargain. They're mine. Careless, knock down the mare and aldermen. But play, Gaunt, we shall be all day retailing in this manner. Do let us deal wholesale. What say you, little premium? 
give me three hundred pounds for the rest of the family in the lump. Ay, ay, that will be the best way. Well, well, anything to accommodate you. They are mine. But there is one portrait which you have always passed over. What? That ill-looking little fellow over the settee? Yes, sir, I mean that. Though I don't think him so ill-looking a little fellow by any means. What, that? Oh, that's my Uncle Oliver. T'was done before he went to India. Your Uncle Oliver? Gad, then you'll never be friends, Charles. That now, to me, is as stern a looking rogue as ever I saw. An unforgiving eye, and a damned disinheriting countenance. An inveterate knave, depend upon it. Don't you think so, little premium? Upon my soul, sir, I do not. I think it is as honest a looking face as any in the room, dead or alive. But I suppose Uncle Oliver goes with the rest of the lumber? No, hang it. I'll not part with poor Noll. The old fellow has been very good to me, and egad, I'll keep his picture while I've a room to put it in. Aside. The rogue's my nephew after all. But, sir, I have somehow taken a fancy to that picture. I'm sorry for it, for you certainly will not have it. Owns, haven't you got enough of them? Aside. I forgive him everything. But, sir, when I take a whim in my head, I don't value money. I'll give you as much for that as for all the rest. Don't tease me, Master Broker. I tell you, I'll not part with it, and there's an end of it. Aside. How like his father the dog is. Well, well, I have done. Aside. I did not perceive it before, but I think I never saw such a striking resemblance. Here is a draft for your sum. Why, it is for eight hundred pounds. You will not let Sir Oliver go? Zounds, no, I tell you once more. Well, never mind the difference. We'll balance that another time. But give me your hand on the bargain. You are an honest fellow, Charles. I beg pardon, sir, for being so free. Come, Moses. Hey, gad, this is a whimsical old fellow. But harky premium, you'll prepare lodgings for these gentlemen. Yes, yes. I'll send for them in a day or two. But hold, do now send a genteel conveyance for them, for I assure you, they were most of them used to ride in their own carriages. I will, I will, for all but Oliver. Aye, all but the little Nabob. You're fixed on that? Peremptorily. A dear extravagant rogue. Good day, come Moses. Let me hear now who calls him profligate. Exeunt Sir Oliver Surface and Moses. Why, this is the oddest genius of the sort I ever saw. Egad, he's the Prince of Brokers, I think. I wonder how the devil Moses got acquainted with so honest a fellow. Ah, here's Rowley. Do careless say I'll join the company in a few moments. I will. But don't let that old blockhead persuade you to squander any of that money on old musty debts, or any such nonsense. For tradesmen, Charles, are the most exorbitant fellows. Very true. And paying them is only encouraging them. Nothing else. Ay, ay, never fear. Exit careless. So, this was an odd fellow indeed. Let me see. Two-thirds of this is mine by right, five hundred and thirty-odd pounds. For heaven, I find one's ancestors are more valuable relations than I took them for. Ladies and gentlemen, your most obedient and a very grateful servant. Enter Rowley. Ha! Old Rowley! Egad, you are just come in time to take leave of your old acquaintance. Yes, I heard they were going. But I wonder how you can have such spirits under so many distresses. Why, there's the point. My distresses are so many that I can't afford to part with my spirits. But I shall be rich and splenetic all in good time. However, I suppose you are surprised that I am not more sorrowful at parting with so many near relations. To be sure, tis very affecting. But you see, they never move a muscle. So why should I? There's no making you serious a moment. 
Yes, faith, I am so now. Here, my honest Rowley. Here, get me this changed directly, and take a hundred pounds of it immediately to old Stanley. A hundred pounds? Uh, consider only. Gad's life don't talk about it. Poor Stanley's wants are pressing. And if you don't make haste, we shall have someone call that has a better right to the money. Ah, there's the point. I never will cease dunning you with the old proverb. Be just before you're generous. Why so I would if I could. But justice is an old lame hobbling beldame. And I can't get her to keep pace with generosity for the soul of me. Yet, yeah, Charles, believe me, one hour's reflection. Aye, aye, it's all very true. But hark ye, Rowley, while I have by heaven I'll give. So damn your economy. And now for a hazard. Exeunt. Scene two. The parlour. Enter Sir Oliver Surface and Moses. Well, sir, I think, as Sir Peter said, you have seen Mr. Charles in high glory. It is great pity he's so extravagant. True, but he would not sell my picture. And loves wine and women so much. But he would not sell my picture. And games so deep. But he would not sell my picture. Oh, here's Rowley. Enter Rowley. So, Sir Oliver, I find you have made a purchase. Yes, yes. Our young rake has parted with his ancestors like old tapestry. And here has he commissioned me to re-deliver you part of the purchase money. I mean, though, in your necessitous character of old Stanley. Ah, uh, there is the pity of it all. He is so damn charitable. And left I a hosier and two tailors in the hall who I'm sure won't be paid, and this hundred would satisfy them. Well, well, I'll pay his debts, and his benevolence too. But now I am no more a broker, and you shall introduce me to the elder brother as old Stanley. Not yet a while. Sir Peter, I know, means to call there about this time. Enter Trip. Oh, gentlemen, I beg pardon for not showing you out. This way. Moses? A word. Exeunt Trip and Moses. There's a fellow for you. Would you believe it? That puppy intercepted the Jew on our coming and wanted to raise money before he got to his master. Indeed. Yes, they are now planning an annuity business. Ah, Master Rowley, in my days, servants were content with the follies of their masters when they were worn a little threadbare. But now they have their vices, like their birthday clothes, with the gloss on. Exeunt. Scene three. A library. Discovered Joseph Surface and a servant. No letter from Lady Teasel? No, sir. I am surprised she has not sent if she is prevented from coming. Sir Peter certainly does not suspect me. Yet I wish I may not lose the heiress through the scrape I have drawn myself into with the wife. However, Charles's imprudence and bad character are great points in my favour. Knocking hard without. Sir, I believe that must be Lady Teasel. Hold! See whether it is or not before you go to the door. I have a particular message for you if it should be my brother. Tis her ladyship, sir. She always leaves her chair at the milliner's in the next street. Stay, stay! Draw that screen before the window. That will do. My opposite neighbour is a maiden lady of so anxious a temper. Servant draws the screen and exit. I have a difficult hand to play in this affair. Lady Teasel has lately suspected my views on Maria, but she must by no means be let into that secret, at least till I have her more in my power. Enter Lady Teasel. What? Sentiment and soliloquy now? Have you been very impatient? Oh, Lud, don't pretend to look grave. I vow I couldn't come before. Oh, madam, punctuality is a species of constancy, a very unfashionable quality in a lady. Upon my word, you ought to pity me. Do you know Sir Peter has grown so ill-natured to me of late, and so jealous of Charles, too? That's the best of the story, isn't it? Aside. I'm glad my scandalous friends keep that up. I am sure I wish he would let Maria marry him, and then perhaps he would be convinced. 
Don't you, Mr. Surface? Aside. Indeed, I do not. Oh, certainly I do, for then my dear Lady Teasel would also be convinced how wrong her suspicions were of my having any design on the silly girl. Well, well, I'm inclined to believe you. But isn't it provoking to have the most ill-natured things said of one? And there's my friend, Lady Snearwell, has circulated I don't know how many scandalous tales of me, and all without any foundation to. That's what vexes me. Ay, madam, to be sure, that is the provoking circumstance. Without foundation. Yes, yes, there's the mortification indeed. For when a scandalous story is believed against one, there certainly is no comfort like the consciousness of having deserved it. No, to be sure. Then I'd forgive their malice. But to attack me, who am really so innocent, and who never say an ill-natured thing of anybody, that is, of any friend, and then Sir Peter, too, to have him so peevish and so suspicious, when I know the integrity of my own heart. Indeed, tis monstrous. But, my dear Lady Teasel, tis your own fault if you suffer it. When a husband entertains a groundless suspicion of his wife, and withdraws his confidence from her, the original compact is broken, and she owes it to the honour of her sex to outwit him. Indeed. So that if he suspects me without cause, it follows that the best way of curing his jealousy is to give him reason for it. Undoubtedly, for your husband would never be deceived in you, and in that case it becomes you to be frail in compliment to his discernment. To be sure, what you say is very reasonable, and when the consciousness of my innocence— Ah, oh, my dear madam, there is the great mistake. Tis this very conscious innocence that is of the greatest prejudice to you. What is it makes you negligent of forms and careless of the world's opinion? Why, the consciousness of your own innocence. What makes you thoughtless in your own conduct and apt to run into a thousand little imprudences? Why, the consciousness of your own innocence. What makes you impatient of Sir Peter's temper and outrageous of his suspicions? Why, the consciousness of your innocence. Tis very true. Now, my dear Lady Teasel, if you would but once make a trifling faux pas, you can't conceive how cautious you would grow, and how ready to humour and agree with your husband. Do you think so? Oh, I'm sure, Aunt. And then you would find all scandal would cease at once. For, in short, your character at present is like a person in a plethora, absolutely dying from too much health. So, so. Then I perceive your prescription is that I must sin in my own defence, and part with my virtue to secure my reputation. Exactly so. Upon my credit, ma'am. Well, certainly this is the oddest doctrine and the newest recipe for avoiding calumny. An infallible one, believe me. Prudence, like experience, must be paid for. Why, if my understanding were once convinced. Oh, certainly, madam, your understanding should be convinced. Yes, yes. Heaven forbid I should persuade you to do anything you thought wrong. No, no, I have too much honour to desire it. Don't you think we may as well leave honour out of the question? Ah, the ill effects of your country education, I see, still remain with you. I doubt they do indeed. And I will fairly own to you that if I could be persuaded to do wrong, it would be by Sir Peter's ill usage sooner than your honourable logic, after all. Then by this hand— which he is unworthy of. Taking her hand. Enter servant. Step, you blockhead, what do you want? I beg your pardon, sir, but I thought you would not choose Sir Peter to come up without announcing him. Sir Peter? Oons! The devil! Sir Peter? Oh, lud, I'm ruined! I'm ruined! Sir, twasn't. I let him in. Oh, I'm quite undone. What will become of me? Now, Mr. Logic! Oh, he's on the stairs. I'll get behind here, and if I'm ever so imprudent again— Goes behind the screen. Give me that book! Sits down. Servant pretends to adjust his hair. Enter Sir Peter. Ay, ever improving himself. Mr. Surface? Mr. Surface? Oh, my dear Sir Peter, I beg your pardon. Gaping, throws away the book. I have been dozing over a stupid book. Well, I'm much obliged to you for this call. You haven't been here, I believe, since I fitted up this room. Books, you know, are the only things in which I am a coxcomb. 
there's very neat indeed well well that's proper you can even make your screen a source of knowledge hung i perceive with maps oh yes i have find great use in that screen i dare say you must certainly when you want to find anything in a hurry aside i ought to hide anything in a hurry either well i have a little private business joseph to the servant you need not stay no sir exit here's a chair sir peter i beg well now we are alone there is a subject my dear friend on which i wish to unburden my mind to you a point of the greatest moment to my peace in short my dear friend lady teasel's conduct of late has made me extremely unhappy indeed i am very sorry to hear it ay tis too plain she has not the least regard for me but what's worse i have pretty good authority to suppose she has formed an attachment to another indeed you astonish me yes and between ourselves i think i have discovered the person how you alarm me exceedingly ay my dear friend i knew you would sympathize with me yes believe me sir peter such a discovery would hurt me just as much as it would you i am convinced of it ah oh, it is a happiness to have a friend whom we can trust even with one's family secrets but have you no guess who i mean i haven't the most distant idea it can't be sir benjamin backbite oh no what say you to charles my brother impossible oh my dear friend the goodness of your own heart misleads you you judge of others by yourself certainly sir peter the heart that is conscious of its own integrity is ever slow to credit another's treachery true but your brother has no sentiment you never hear him talk so yet i can't but think lady teasel herself has too much principle ay but what is principle against the flattery of a handsome lively young fellow <laughs> that's very true and there's you know the difference of our ages makes it very improbable that she should have any great affection for me and if she were to be frail and i were to make it public why the tower would only laugh at me the foolish old bachelor who had married a girl that's true to be sure they would laugh laugh ay and make ballads and paragraphs and the devil knows what of me no you must never make it public but then again that the nephew of my old friend sir oliver should be the person to attempt such a wrong hurts me more nearly ay there's the point when ingratitude barbs the dart of injury the wound has double danger in it ay ay that was in a manner left his guardian in whose house he had been so often entertained who never in my life denied him my advice oh tis not to be credited there may be a man capable of such baseness to be sure but for my part till you can give me positive proofs i cannot but doubt it however if it should be proved on him he is no longer a brother of mine i disclaim kindred with him for the man who can break the laws of hospitality and tempt the wife of his friend deserves to be branded as the pest of society what a difference there is between you what noble sentiments yet i cannot suspect lady teasel's honour i am sure i wish to think well of her and to remove all ground of quarrel between us she has lately reproached me more than once with having made no settlement on her and in our last quarrel she almost hinted that she should not break her heart if i was dead now as we seem to differ in our ideas of expense i have resolved she shall have her own way and be her own mistress in that respect for the future and if i were to die she will find i have not been inattentive to her interest while living here my friend are the drafts of two deeds which i wish to have your opinion on by one she will enjoy eight hundred a year independent while i live and by the other the bulk of my fortune at my death this conduct sir peter is indeed truly generous aside i wish it may not corrupt my pupil 
yes i am determined she shall have no cause to complain though i would not have her acquainted with the latter instance of my affection yet a while aside nor i if i could help it and now my dear friend if you please we will talk over the situation of your affairs with maria oh no sir peter another time if you please i am sensibly chagrined at the little progress you seem to make in her affections i beg you will not mention it what are my disappointments when your happiness is in debate Steph, i shall be ruined every way and though you are so averse to my acquainting lady teasel with your passion for maria i'm sure she's not your enemy in the affair pray sir peter now oblige me i am really too much affected by the subject we have been speaking of to bestow a thought on my own concerns the man who is entrusted with his friend's distresses can never enter servant your brother sir is speaking to a gentleman in the street and says he knows you are within steph blockhead i'm not within i'm out for the day stay hold a thought has struck me you shall be at home well well let him up exit servant aside he'll interrupt sir peter however now my good friend oblige me i entreat you before charles comes let me conceal myself somewhere then do you tax him on the point we have been talking and his answer may satisfy me at once oh fie sir peter would you have me join in so mean a trick to trepan my brother too nay you tell me you are sure he is innocent if so you do him the greatest service by giving him an opportunity to clear himself and you will set my heart at rest come you shall not refuse me here behind the screen will be hey what the devil there seems to be one listener there already i'll swear i saw a petticoat <laughs> well this is ridiculous enough i'll tell you sir peter though i hold the man of intrigue to be a most despicable character yet you know it does not follow that one is to be an absolute joseph either harky it is a little french milliner a, a silly rogue that plagues me and having some character to lose on your coming sir she ran behind the screen ah oh, you rogue but egad she has overheard all i have been saying of my wife oh twill never go any farther you may depend upon it no then faith let her hear it out here's a closet will do as well well go in there sly rogue sly rogue going into the closet a narrow escape indeed and a curious situation i'm in to part man and wife in this manner lady teasel peeping couldn't i steal off keep close my angel sir peter peeping joseph tax him home back my dear friend lady teasel peeping couldn't you lock sir peter in be still my life sir peter peeping you're sure the little milliner won't blab in in my good sir peter forget i wish i had a key to the door enter charles surface holloa brother what has been the matter your fellow would not let me up at first what have you had a jew or a wench with you neither brother i assure you but what has made sir peter steal off i thought he had been with you well, he was brother but hearing you were coming he did not choose to stay what was the old gentleman afraid i wanted to borrow money of him no sir but i am sorry to find charles that you have lately given that worthy man grounds for great uneasiness yes they tell me i do that to a great many worthy men but how so pray to be plain with you brother he thinks you are endeavouring to gain lady teasel's affections from him who i oh lud not i upon my word <laughs> so the old fellow has found out that he has got a young wife has he or what is worse lady teasel has found out she has an old husband this is no subject to jest on brother he who can laugh true true as you were going to say then seriously i never had the least idea of what you charge me with upon my honour well it will give sir peter great satisfaction to hear this to be sure i once thought the lady seemed to have taken a fancy to me but upon my soul i never gave her the least encouragement 
Besides, you know my attachment to Maria. But sure, brother, even if Lady Teasel had betrayed the fondest partiality for you. Why, look ye, Joseph, I hope I shall never deliberately do a dishonourable action. But if a pretty woman was purposely to throw herself in my way, and that pretty woman married to a man old enough to be her father, well, why, I believe I should be obliged to borrow a little of your morality. That's all. But, brother, do you know now that you surprise me exceedingly by naming me with Lady Teasel? For a faith, I always understood you were her favourite. No, for shame, Charles. This retort is foolish. Nay, I swear, I have seen you exchange significant glances. Nay, nay, sir, this is no jest. Egad, I'm serious. Don't you remember one day when I called here? Nay, pretty Charles. And found you together? Zoon, sir, I insist. And another time when your servant? Brother, brother, a word with you. Aside. Egad, I must stop him. Informed, I say that. Hush, I beg your pardon, but Sir Peter has overheard all we have been saying. I knew you would clear yourself, or I should never have consented. How, Sir Peter? Where is he? Softly! There! Points to the closet. Oh, for heaven I'll have him out. Sir Peter, come forth. No, no! I say, Sir Peter, come into court. Pulls in, Sir Peter. What? My old guardian? What? Turn inquisitor and take evidence in cog? Give me your hand, Charles. I believe I have suspected you wrongfully. But you mustn't be angry with Joseph. It was my plan. Indeed. But I acquit you. I promise you I don't think near so ill of you as I did. What I have heard has given me great satisfaction. Apart to Joseph. Egad, then twas lucky you didn't hear any more, wasn't it, Joseph? Ah, you would have retorted on him. Aye, aye, that was a joke. Yes, yes, I know his honour too well. Apart to Joseph. But you might as well have suspected him as me in this matter, for all that. Mightn't he, Joseph? Well, well, I believe you. Aside. Would they were both well out of the room. Enter servant and whispers Joseph Surface. And in future, perhaps, we may not be such strangers. Gentlemen, I beg pardon, I must wait on you downstairs. Here is a person come on particular business. Well, you can see him in another room. Sir Peter and I have not met a long time, and I have something to say to him. Aside. They must not be left together. I'll send this man away and return directly. Apart to Sir Peter. Sir Peter, not a word of the French milliner. And goes out. Apart to Joseph. Aye, not for the world. Ah, Charles, if you associated more with your brother, one might indeed hope for your reformation. He is a man of sentiment. Well, there is nothing in the world so noble as a man of sentiment. Sir, he is too moral by half, and so apprehensive of his good name as he calls it, that I suppose he would as soon let a priest into his house as a girl. No, no, come, come, you wrong him. No, no, Joseph is no rake, but he is no such saint either in that respect. Aside. I have a great mind to tell him we should have a laugh at Joseph. Oh, hang him, he's a very anchorite, a young hermit. Arky, you must not abuse him. He may chance to hear of it again, I promise you. Why, you won't tell him? No, but this way. Aside. Egad, I'll tell him. Harky, have you a mind to have a good laugh at Joseph? I should like it of all things. Then, e faith, we will. I'll be quit with him for discovering me. He had a girl with him when I called. What? Joseph? You jest. Hush! A little French milliner, and the best of the jest is, she's in the room now. The devil she is. Hush, I tell you. Points. Behind the screen. Zlife, let's unveil her. No, no, he's coming. You shan't, indeed. Oh, we gad, we'll have a peep at the little milliner. 
not for the world joseph will never forgive me i'll stand by you odds here he is joseph surface enters just as charles surface throws down the screen lady teasel by all that's wonderful lady teasel by all that's damnable sir peter this is one of the smartest French milliners I ever saw. Egad, you seem all to have been diverting yourselves here at hide-and-seek, and I don't see who is out of the secret. Shall I beg your ladyship to inform me? Not a word. Brother, will you be pleased to explain this matter? What, is morality dumb too? Sir Peter, though I found you in the dark perhaps you are not so now all mute well though i can make nothing of the affair i suppose you perfectly understand one another so i leave you to yourselves brother i'm sorry to find you have given that worthy man cause for so much uneasiness sir peter there's nothing in the world so noble as a man of sentiment. Exit Charles. They stand for some time looking at each other. Sir Peter, notwithstanding, I confess, that appearances are against me, but if you will afford me your patience, I make no doubt, but I shall explain everything to your satisfaction. If you please, sir. Well, the fact is, sir, that Lady Teasel, knowing my pretensions to your ward, Maria, I may say, sir, Lady Teasel, being apprehensive of the jealousy of your temper, and knowing my friendship to the family, she, sir, I say, called here, uh, in order that I might explain these pretensions. But on your coming, uh, being apprehensive, as I said, of your jealousy, she, she withdrew, and, and this, you may depend on it, is the whole truth of the matter. A very clear account, upon my word, and I dare say the lady will vouch for every article of it for not one word of it sir peter how oh, don't you think it worth while to agree in the lie there is not one syllable of truth in what that gentleman has told you i believe you upon my soul ma'am aside to lady teasel steph madam will you betray me good master hypocrite by your leave i'll speak for myself ay let her alone sir you'll find she'll make out a better story than you without prompting hear me sir peter i came hither on no matter relating to your ward and even ignorant of this gentleman's pretensions to her but i came seduced by his insidious arguments at least to listen to his pretended passion if not to sacrifice your honour to his baseness no i believe the truth is coming indeed the woman's mad no sir she has recovered her senses and your own arts have furnished her with the means. Sir Peter, I do not expect you to credit me, but the tenderness you expressed for me, when I am sure you could not think I was a witness to it, has penetrated so to my heart, that had I left the place without the shame of this discovery, my future life should have spoken the sincerity of my gratitude. As for that smooth-tongued hypocrite, who would have seduced the wife of his too credulous friend, while he effected honourable address to his ward, I behold him now in a light so truly despicable, that I shall never again respect myself for having listened to him. Exit Lady Teasel. Notwithstanding all this, Sir Peter, heaven knows— That you are a villain, and so I leave you to your conscience. You are too rash, Sir Peter. You shall hear me. The man who shuts out conviction by refusing to— Exeunt Sir Peter and Surface, talking. End of Act 4 Act 5 Scene 1 The Library in Joseph Surface's House Enter Joseph Surface and Servant. Mr. Stanley, and why should you think I would see him? You must know he comes to ask something. Sir, I should not have let him in, but that Mr. Rowley came to the door with him. Oh, sha! Blockhead! To suppose that I should now be in a temper to receive visits from poor relations. Well, why don't you show the fellow up? I will, sir. Why, sir, it was not my fault that Sir Peter discovered my lady. Go, fool! 
Exit servant. Sure, fortune never played a man of my policy such a trick before. My character with Sir Peter, my hopes with Maria, destroyed in a moment. I'm in a rare humour to listen to other people's distresses. I shan't be able to bestow even a benevolent sentiment on Stanley. So, here he comes, and Rowley with him. I must try to recover myself and put a little charity into my face, however. Exit. Enter Sir Oliver Surface and Rowley. What? Does he avoid us? That was he, was it not? It was, sir. Uh, but I doubt you are come a little too abruptly. His nerves are so weak that the sight of a poor relation may be too much for him. Oh, I should have gone first to break it to him. Oh, plague of his nerves! Yet this is he who Sir Peter extols as a man of the most benevolent way of thinking? As to his way of thinking, I cannot pretend to decide. For to do him justice, he appears to have as much speculative benevolence as any uh, private gentleman in the kingdom, though he is seldom so sensual as to indulge himself in the exercise of it. Yet has a string of charitable sentiments at his finger's end. Or rather his tongue's end, Sir Oliver. For I believe there is no sentiment he has such faith in as that charity begins at home. And his, I presume, is of that domestic sort which never stirs abroad at all? I doubt you'll find it so. But he's coming. I mustn't seem to interrupt you. And you know, immediately as you leave him, I come in to announce your arrival in your real character. True. And afterwards you'll meet me at Sir Peter's. Without losing a moment. Exit. I don't like the compliance of his features. Enter Joseph Surface. Sir, I beg you ten thousand pardons for keeping you a moment waiting. Mr. Stanley, I presume. At your service. Sir, I beg you will do me the honour to sit down. I entreat you, sir. Dear sir, there's no occasion. Aside. Too civil by half. I have not the pleasure of knowing you, Mr. Stanley, but I am extremely happy to see you look so well. You are nearly related to my mother, I think, Mr. Stanley. I was, sir. So nearly that my present poverty, I fear, may do discredit to her wealthy children. Else I should not have presumed to trouble you. Dear sir, there needs no apology. He that is in distress, though a stranger, has a right to claim kindred with the wealthy. I'm sure I wish I was of that class, and had it in my power to offer you even a small relief. If your uncle, Sir Oliver, were here, I would have a friend. I wish he was, sir, with all my heart. You should not want an advocate with him, believe me, sir. I should not need one. My distresses would recommend me but I imagined his bounty would enable you to become the agent of his charity. My dear sir, you were strangely misinformed. Sir Oliver is a worthy man, a very worthy man. But avarice, Mr. Stanley, is the vice of age. I will tell you, my good sir, in confidence, what he has done for me has been a mere nothing. Though people I know have thought otherwise, and for my part I never chose to contradict the report. What? Has he never transmitted you bullion, rubies, pagodas? Oh, dear sir, nothing of the kind. <laughs> no, no, a few presents now and then, china, shawls, congu tea, avidavits, and Indian crackers. Little more, believe me. Aside. Here's gratitude for twelve thousand pounds. Avidavits and Indian crackers. Then, my dear sir, you have heard, I doubt not, of the extravagance of my brother. There are very few who would credit what I have done for that unfortunate young man. Aside. Not I, for one. Oh, the sums I have lent him. Indeed, I have been exceedingly to blame. It was an amiable weakness. However, I don't pretend to defend it, and now I feel it doubly culpable, since it has deprived me of the pleasure of serving you, Mr. Stanley, as my heart dictates. Aside. Dissembler. Then, sir, you can't assist me? At present it grieves me to say I cannot, but whenever I have the ability you may depend upon hearing from me. I am extremely sorry. Not more than I, believe me. To pity without the power to relieve is still more painful than to ask and be denied. 
Kind sir, your most obedient servant. You leave me deeply affected, Mr. Stanley. William, be ready to open the door. Oh, dear sir, no ceremony. You're very obedient. Sir, you're most obsequious. You may depend upon hearing from me whenever I can be of service. Sweet sir, you are too good. In the meantime, I wish you health and spirits. Your ever grateful and perpetual humble servant. Sir, yours as sincerely. Aside. Charles, you are my heir. Exit. This is one bad effect of a good character. It invites application from the unfortunate, and there needs no small degree of address to gain the reputation of benevolence without incurring the expense. The silver ore of pure charity is an expensive article in the catalogue of a man's good qualities, whereas the sentimental French plate I use in place of it makes just as good a show and pays less tax. Enter Rowley. Mr. Surface, your servant. I was apprehensive of interrupting you, though my business demands immediate attention, as this note will inform you. Always happy to see Mr. Rowley. Reads the letter. Sir Oliver Surface? My uncle arrived. He is indeed. We have just parted. Quite well, after a speedy voyage, and impatient to embrace his worthy nephew. I, I am astonished. William, stop Mr. Stanley if he's not gone. Oh, he's out of reach, I believe. Why did you not let me know this when you came in together? I thought you had particular business. But I must be gone to inform your brother, and appoint him to meet your uncle. He will be with you in a quarter of an hour. So he says. Well, I am strangely overjoyed at his coming. Aside. Never to be sure was anything so damned unlucky. You will be delighted to see how well he looks. Ah, I am rejoiced to hear it. Aside. Just at this time. I'll tell him how impatiently you expect him. Do, do, pray give my best duty and affection. Indeed, I cannot express the sensations I feel at the thought of seeing him. Exit Rowley. <laughs> Certainly his coming just at this time is the cruelest piece of ill fortune. Exit. Scene 2. Sir Peter Teasels. Enter Mrs. Candor and Maid. Indeed, ma'am. The lady will see nobody at present. Did you tell her it was her friend Mrs. Candor? Yes, ma'am, but she begs you will excuse her. Do go again. I shall be glad to see her, if only for a moment, for I am sure she must be in great distress. Exit maid. Dear heart, how provoking! I am not mistress of half the circumstances. We shall have the whole affair in the newspapers, with the names of the parties at length, before I have dropped the story at a dozen houses. Enter Sir Benjamin Backbite. Oh, Sir Benjamin, you have heard, I suppose. Of Lady Teasel and Mr. Service. And Sir Peter's discovery. Oh, the strangest piece of business, to be sure. Well, I never was so surprised in my life. I'm sorry for all parties, indeed. Now, I don't pity Sir Peter at all. He was so extravagantly partial to Mr. Surface. Mr. Surface? Why, twas with Charles Lady Teasel was detected. No, no, I tell you, Mr. Surface is the gallant. No such thing. Charles is the man. Twas Mr. Service brought Sir Peter on purpose to discover them. I tell you, I had it from one. And I have it from one immediately. Who had it from one who had it? But here comes Lady Sneerwell. Perhaps she knows the whole affair. Enter Lady Sneerwell. So, my dear Mrs. Candor, here's a sad affair of our friend, Lady Teasel. I, my dear friend, who would have thought? Well, there is no trusting appearances, though indeed she was always too lively for me. To be sure, her manners were a little too free, but then she was young. And had indeed some good qualities. So she had indeed. But have you heard the particulars? No, but everybody says that Mr. Surface... I there. I told you, Mr. Surface was the man. No, no, indeed, the assignation was with Charles. With Charles? You alarm me, Mrs. Candor. Yes, yes, he was the lover. Mr. Surface, to do him justice, was only the informer. Well, I'll not dispute it with you, Mrs. Candor. But, be which it may, 
I hope that Sir Peter's wound will not. Sir Peter's wound? Oh, mercy, I didn't hear a word of their fighting. Nor I a syllable. No? What? No mention of the duel? Not a word. Oh, yes. They fought before they left the room. Pray let us hear. I do oblige us with the duel. So, says Sir Peter, immediately after the discovery, you are a most ungrateful fellow. I to Charles. No, no, to Mr. Surface. A most ungrateful fellow. And old as I am, sir, says he, I insist on immediate satisfaction. Ay, that must have been to Charles, for tis very unlikely Mr. Surface should fight in his own house. Gets life, ma'am, not at all, giving me satisfaction. On this, ma'am, Lady Teasel, seeing Sir Peter in such danger, ran out of the room in strong hysterics, and Charles after her, calling out for Hartshorn and water, and then, madam, they began to fight with swords. Enter Crabtree. With pistols, nephew, pistols. I have it from undoubted authority. Oh, Mr. Crabtree, then it is all true. Too true indeed, madam, and Sir Peter is dangerously wounded. By a thrust in second quite through his left side. By a bullet lodged in the thorax. Mercy on me, poor Sir Peter. Yes, ma'am, though Charles would have avoided the matter if he could. I knew Charles was the person. My uncle, I see, knows nothing of the matter. But Sir Peter taxed him with the basest ingratitude. That I told you, you know. Do, nephew, let me speak, and insisted on immediate... Just as I said. Odd's life, nephew, allow others to know something too. A pair of pistols lay on the bureau, for Mr. Surface, it seems, had come home the night before late from Salt Hill, where he had been to see the Montem with a friend who has a son at Eton. So, luckily, the pistols were left charged. Sir Peter forced Charles to take one. They fired, it seems, pretty nearly together. Charles's shot took effect, as I tell you, and Sir Peter's missed. But what is very extraordinary, the ball struck against a little bronze Shakespeare that stood over the fireplace, grazed out of the window at a right angle, and wounded the postman, who was just coming to the door with a double letter from Northamptonshire. My uncle's account is more circumstantial, I confess, but I believe mine is the true one for all that. Aside, I am more interested in this affair than they imagine, and must have better information. Exit Lady Sneerwell. Ah, Lady Sneerwell's alarm is very easily accounted for. Yes, yes, they certainly do say, but that's neither here nor there. But pray, where is Sir Peter at present? Oh, they brought him home and he is now in the house, though the servants are ordered to deny him. I believe so, and Lady Teasel, I suppose, attending him. Yes, yes, and I saw one of the faculty enter just before me. Hey, who comes here? Oh, this is he, the physician, depend on it. Oh, certainly, it must be the physician, and now we shall know. Enter Sir Oliver Surface. Well, doctor, what hopes? Ah, doctor, how is your patient? Now, Doctor, isn't it a wound with a small sword? A bullet lodged in the thorax for a hundred. Doctor, a wound with a small sword and a bullet in the thorax? Owns, are you mad, good people? Perhaps, sir, you are not a doctor? Truly, I am to thank you for my degree if I am. Only a friend of Sir Peter's, then, I presume. But, sir, you must have heard of his accident. Not a word. Not of his being dangerously wounded? The devil he is! Run through the body! Shot in the breast! By one Mr. Surface! Aye, the younger! Hey, what the plague! You seem to differ strangely in your accounts. However, you agree that Sir Peter is dangerously wounded? Oh, yes, we agree there. Yes, yes, I believe there can be no doubt of that. Then, upon my word, for a person in that situation, he is the most imprudent man alive. For here he comes walking as if nothing at all was the matter. Enter Sir Peter Teasel. Odds heart, Sir Peter, you are come in good time, I promise you, for we had just given you over. Egad, uncle, this is the most sudden recovery. 
Why, man, what do you do out of bed with a small sword through your body and a bullet lodged in your thorax? A small sword and a bullet? Aye, these gentlemen would have killed you without law or physic, and wanted to dub me a doctor to make me an accomplice. Why, what is all this? We rejoice, Sir Peter, that the story of the duel is not true, and are sincerely sorry for your other misfortune. Aside. So, so, all over the town already. Though, Sir Peter, you were certainly vastly to blame to marry at your years. Sir, what business is that of yours? Though, indeed, as Sir Peter made so good a husband, he's very much to be pitied. Plague on your pity, ma'am. I desire none of it. However, Sir Peter, you must not mind the laughing and jests you will meet with on the occasion. Sir, sir, I desire to be master in my own house. Tis no uncommon case, that's one comfort. I insist on being left to myself, without ceremony. I insist on your leaving my house directly. Well, well, we are going, and depend on it, we'll make the best report of it we can. Exit. Leave my house. And tell how hardly you've been treated. Exit. Leave my house. And how patiently you bear it. Exit. Fiends, vipers, furies. Oh, that their own venom would choke them. They are very provoking indeed, Sir Peter. Enter Rowley. I heard high words. What has ruffled you, sir? But sure. What signifies asking? Do I ever pass a day without my vexations? Well, I'm not inquisitive. Well, Sir Peter, I have seen both my nephews in the manner we proposed. A precious couple they are. Yes, and Sir Oliver is convinced that your judgment was right, Sir Peter. Yes, I find Joseph is indeed the man, after all. Aye, as Sir Peter says... He is a man of sentiment. And acts up to the sentiments he professes. It certainly is edification to hear him talk. Oh, he's a model for the young men of the age. But how's this, Sir Peter? You don't join us in your friend Joseph's praise, as I expected. Sir Oliver, we live in a damned wicked world, and the fewer we praise, the better. What? Do you say so, Sir Peter? who were never mistaken in your life. Pshaw! Plague on you both! I see, by your sneering, you have heard the whole affair. I shall go mad among you. Then, uh, to fret you no longer, Sir Peter, we are indeed acquainted with it all. I met Lady Teasel coming from Mr. Surfaces so humbled that she deigned to request me to be her advocate with you. And does Sir Oliver know all this? Every circumstance. What? Of the closet and the screen? Hey? Yes, yes, and the little French milliner. Oh, I have been vastly diverted with the story. <laughs> it was very pleasant. I never laughed more in my life, I assure you. <laughs> oh, vastly diverting. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, to be sure, <laughs> Joseph with his sentiments. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, his sentiments. Ha, ha, ha. Hypocritical villain. Aye, and that rogue Charles to pull Sir Peter out of the closet. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, ha, t'was devilish entertaining, to be sure. <laughs> Egad, Sir Peter, I should like to have seen your face when the screen was thrown down. Ha, ha. Yes, yes, my face when the screen was thrown down. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, I must never show my head again. But come, come. It isn't fair to laugh at you neither, my old friend. Though upon my word, I can't help it. Oh, pray don't restrain your mirth on my account. It does not hurt me at all. I laugh at the whole affair myself. Yes, yes, I think... Being a standing jest for all one's acquaintance, a very happy situation. Oh, yes, and then of a morning to read the paragraphs about Mr. S., Lady T., and Sir P. will be so entertaining. Without affection, Sir Peter, you may despise the ridicule of fools. 
but i see lady teasel going towards the next room i am sure you must desire reconciliation as earnestly as she does perhaps my being here prevents her coming to you well i'll leave honest rowley to meditate between you but he must bring you all presently to mr services where i am now returning if not to reclaim a libertine at least to expose hypocrisy ah i'll be present at your discovering yourself there with all my heart though tis a vile unlucky place for discoveries will follow exit sir oliver she is not coming here you see rowley no uh, but she has left the door of that room open you perceive see uh, she is in tears certainly a little mortification appears very becoming in a wife don't you think it will do her good to let her pine a little oh this is ungenerous in you well i know not what to think you remember the letter i found of hers evidently intended for charles a mere forgery sir peter laid in your way on purpose this is one of the points which i intend snake shall give you conviction of i wish i were once satisfied of that she looks this way what a remarkably elegant turn of head she has rowley i'll go to her certainly though when it is known that we are reconciled people will laugh at me ten times more let them laugh and retort their malice only by showing them you are happy in spite of it i faith so i will and if i'm not mistaken we may yet be the happiest couple in the country nay sir peter he who once lays aside suspicion hold master rowley if you have any regard for me let me never hear you utter anything like a sentiment i have had enough of them to serve me the rest of my life Exeunt. Scene three. The library in Joseph Surface's house. Enter Joseph Surface and Lady Sneerwell. Impossible! Will not Sir Peter immediately be reconciled to Charles, and of course no longer oppose his union with Maria? The thought is distraction to me. Can passion furnish a remedy? No, nor cunning neither. Oh, I was a fool, an idiot, to league with such a blunderer. Lady Sneerwell, I am the greatest sufferer. Yet you see, I bear the accident with calmness. Because the disappointment doesn't reach your heart. Your interest only attached you to Maria. Had you felt for her what I have for that ungrateful libertine, neither your temper nor hypocrisy could prevent your showing the sharpness of your vexation. But why should your reproaches fall on me for this disappointment? Are you not the cause of it? Had you not a sufficient field for your roguery in imposing upon Sir Peter, and supplanting your brother, but you must endeavour to seduce his wife? I hate such an avarice of crimes. Tis an unfair monopoly, and never prospers. Well, I admit I have been to blame. I, I confess I deviated from the direct road of wrong. But I don't think we're so totally defeated, neither. No. You tell me you've made a trial of snakes since we met? I do believe so. And that he has undertaken, should it be necessary, to swear and prove that Charles is at this time contracted by vows and honour to your ladyship, which some of his former letters to you will serve to support? This, indeed, might have assisted. Come, come, it is not too late yet. Knocking at the door. But hark, uh, this is probably my uncle, Sir Oliver. Uh, retire to that room. We'll consult father when he's gone. Well, but if he should find you out too— Oh, I have no fear of that. Sir Peter will hold his tongue for his own credit's sake, and you may depend on it I shall soon discover Sir Oliver's weak side. I have no diffidence of your abilities. Only be constant to one roguery at a time. Exit Lady Sneerwell. I will, I will. <clears throat> so, tis confounded hard after such bad fortune to be baited by one's confederate in evil. Well, at all events, my character is so much better than Charles's that I certainly— Hey, what? This is not Sir Oliver, but old Stanley again. Plague on that he should return to tease me just now. I shall have Sir Oliver come and find him here, and— Enter Sir Oliver Surface. Gad's life, Mr. Stanley, why have you come back to plague me at this time? You must not stay now, upon my word. Sir, I hear your Uncle Oliver is expected here. And though he has been so penurious to you, 
I'll try what it'll do for me. Sir, tis impossible for you to stay now, so I must beg. Come any other time, and I promise you you shall be assisted. No, Sir Oliver and I must be acquainted. Soon, sir, that I insist on your quitting the room directly. Nay, sir. Sir, I insist on it. Here, William, show this gentleman out. Since you compel me, sir, not one moment. This is such insolence. Going to push him out. Enter Charles Surface. Hey, Day, what's the matter now? What the devil? Have you got hold of my little broker here? Zounds, brother, don't hurt little premium. What's the matter, my little fellow? So, he's been with you too, has he? To be sure he has. Why, he's as honest a little. But, Sir Joseph, you have not been borrowing money too, have you? Borrowing? No. But, brother, you know we expect Sir Oliver here every. Oh, Gad, that's true. Noll mustn't find the little broker here, to be sure. Yet Mr. Stanley insists. Stanley? Why, his name's Premium. No, sir, Stanley. No, no, Premium. Well, no matter which, but... Aye, aye, Stanley or Premium. Tis the same thing, as you say. For I suppose he goes by half a hundred names, besides A.B. at the coffee-house. Knocking. Steph, here's Sir Oliver at the door. Now I beg, Mr. Stanley... Aye, aye, and I beg, Mr. Premium. Gentlemen. Sir, by heaven you shall go. Aye, out with him, certainly. This violence. Sir, tis your own fault. Out with him, to be sure. Both forcing Sir Oliver out. Enter Sir Peter and Lady Teasel, Maria and Rowley. My old friend Sir Oliver, hey! What in the name of wonder? Here are dutiful nephews. Assault their uncle at a first visit. Indeed, Sir Oliver, twas well we came in to rescue you. Truly it was, for I perceive, Sir Oliver, the character of old Stanley was no protection to you. Neither were premium either. The necessities of the former could not extort a shilling from that benevolent gentleman. And now, egad, I stood a chance of faring worse than my ancestors, and being knocked down without being bid for. Charles! Joseph! Tis now complete! Very. Sir Peter, my friend, and Rowley, too, look on that elder nephew of mine. You know what he has already received from my bounty, and you also know how gladly I would have regarded half my fortune as held in trust for him. Judge, then, my disappointment in discovering him to be destitute of faith, charity, and gratitude. Sir Oliver, I should be more surprised at this declaration if I had not myself found him to be mean, treacherous, and hypocritical. And if the gentleman pleads not guilty to these, pray let him call me to his character. Then, I believe, we need add no more. If he knows himself, he will consider it as the most perfect punishment that he is known to the world. Aside. If they talk this way to honesty, what will they say to me by and by? As for that prodigal, his brother there. Aside. Aye, now comes my turn. The damned family pictures will ruin me. Sir Oliver, uncle, will you honour me with a hearing? Aside. Now, if Joseph would make one of his long speeches, I might recollect myself a little. I suppose you would undertake to justify yourself entirely. I trust I could. Well, sir, and you could justify yourself too, I suppose? Not that I know of, Sir Oliver. What? Little premium has been let too much into the secret, I suppose? True, sir. But they were family secrets, and should not be mentioned again, you know. Uh, come, Sir Oliver, I know you cannot speak of Charles's follies with anger. Odds heart, no more can I, nor with gravity either. Sir Peter, do you know the rogue bargained with me for all his ancestors, sold me judges and generals by the foot, and maiden aunts as cheap as broken china? To be sure, Sir Oliver, I did make a little free with the family canvas. That's the truth on it. My ancestors may rise in judgment against me. There's no denying it. But believe me sincere when I tell you, and upon my soul I would not say so if I was not, that if I do not appear mortified at the exposure of my follies, it is because I feel at this moment the warmest satisfaction in seeing you, my liberal benefactor. Charles, I believe you. 
Give me your hand again. The ill-looking little fellow over the settee has made your peace. Then, sir, my gratitude to the original is still increased. Yet I believe, Sir Oliver, here is one whom Charles is still more anxious to be reconciled to, pointing to Maria. Oh, I have heard of his attachment there, and, with the young lady's pardon, if I construe right, that blush. Well, child, speak your sentiments. Sir, I have little to say, but I shall rejoice to hear that he is happy. For me, whatever I claim I had to his affection, I willingly resign to one who has a better title. How, Maria? Hey, day, what's the mystery now? While he appeared to be an incorrigible rake, you would give your hand to no one else. And now that he is likely to reform, I warrant you won't have him. His own heart, and Lady Sneerwell knows the cause. Lady Sneerwell? Brother, it is with great concern I am obliged to speak on this point. But my regard to justice compels me, and Lady Sneerwell's injuries can no longer be concealed. Opens the door. Enter Lady Sneerwell. So, another French milliner. Egad, he has one in every room of the house, I suppose. Ungrateful Charles, well may you be surprised, and feel for the indelicate situation your perfidy has forced me into. Pray, uncle, is this another plot of yours? For as I have life, I don't understand it. I believe, sir, there is but the evidence of one person more necessary to make it extremely clear. And of that person, I imagine, is Mr. Snake. Really, you are perfectly right to bring him with us, and pray let him appear. Walk in, Mr. Snake. Enter Snake. I thought his testimony might be wanted. However, it happens unluckily that he comes to confront Lady Snarewell, not to support her. A villain, treacherous to me at last. Speak, fellow, have you two conspired against me? I begged your ladyship ten thousand pardons. You paid me extremely liberally for the lie in question, but uh, I unfortunately have been offered double to speak the truth. Plot and counterplot, egad. The torments of shame and disappointment on you all. Hold, Lady Sneerwell, before you go. Let me thank you for the trouble you and that gentleman have taken in writing letters from me to Charles, and answering them yourself. And let me also request you to make my respects to the scandalous college, of which you were the president, and inform them that Lady Teasel, licentiate, begs leave to return the diploma they gave her, as she leaves off practice, and kills characters no longer. You too, madam, provoking, insolent. May your husband live these fifty years. Exit. Oons! What a fury! A malicious creature indeed. Hey, not for her last wish. No, no. Well, sir, and what have you to say now? Sir, I am so confounded to find that Lady Snowwell could be guilty of suborning Mr. Snake in this manner to impose on us all, that I know not what to say. However, lest her revengeful spirit should prompt her to injure my brother, I had certainly better follow her directly. Exit. Moral to the last drop. Aye, and marry her, Joseph, if you can. Oil and vinegar, egad. You'll do very well together. I believe we have no more occasion for Mr. Snake at present. Before I go, I beg pardon once for all for whatever uneasiness I have been the humble instrument of causing to the parties present. Well, well, you have made atonement by good deed at last. But I must request of the company that it shall never be known. Hey, what the plague! Are you ashamed of having done a right thing once in your life? Oh, sir, consider. I live by the badness of my character. I have nothing but my infamy to depend on. And if it were once known that I had been betrayed into an honest action, I should lose every friend I have in the world. Well, well, we'll not produce you by saying anything in your praise, never fear. Exit Snake. There's a precious rogue. See, Sir Oliver, there needs no persuasion now to reconcile your nephew and Maria. Aye, aye, that's as it should be. Any gad, we'll have the wedding tomorrow morning. Thank you, dear uncle. What, you rogue? Don't you ask the girl's consent first? Oh, 
I have done that a long time, a minute ago. And she has looked, yes. For shame, Charles, I protest. Sir Peter, there has not been a word. Well, then, the fewer the better. May your love for each other never know abatement. And may you live as happily together as Lady Teasel and I intend to do. Rowley, my old friend, I am sure you congratulate me, and I suspect that I owe you much. You do indeed, Charles. If my efforts to serve you had not succeeded, you would have been in my debt for the attempt. But deserve to be happy, and you overpay me. I, honest Rowley, always said you would reform. Why, as to reforming, Sir Peter, I'll make no promises. And that I take to be a proof that I intend to set about it. But here shall be my monitor, my gentle guide. Ah, oh, can I leave the virtuous path those eyes illumine? Though thou, dear maid, shouldst wave thy beauty sway, thou still must rule, because I will obey. An humble fugitive from folly view, no sanctuary near but love and you. To the audience. You can indeed each anxious fear remove, for even scandal dies if you approve. Epilogue by George Coleman I, who was late so volatile and gay, like a trade wind must now blow all one way, bend all my cares, my studies, and my vows to one dull rusty weathercock my spouse. So wills our virtuous bard, the motley bays of crying epilogues and laughing plays. Old bachelors, who marry smart young wives, learn from our play to regulate your lives. Each bring his dear to town, all faults upon her. London will prove the very source of honour. Plunged fairly in, like a cold bath it serves, when principles relax, to brace the nerves. Such is my case, and yet I must deplore that the gay dream of dissipation's o'er. And say, ye fair, was ever lively wife, born with a genius for the highest life, like me untimely blasted in her bloom, like me condemned to such a dismal doom? Save money, when I just knew how to waste it, leave London, just as I began to taste it. Must I then watch the early crowing cock, the melancholy ticking of a clock, in a lone rustic hall, for ever pounded with dogs, cats, rats, and squalling brats surrounded? With humble curate can I now retire, while good Sir Peter boozes with the squire, and at backgammon mortify my soul that pants for loo or flutters at a vole? Seven's the main, dear sound that must expire, lost at hot cockles round a Christmas fire. The transient hour of fashion too soon spent, farewell the tranquil mind, farewell content. Farewell the plumed head, the cushioned tet that takes the cushion from its proper seat. The spirit stirring drum, card drums I mean, spadiel, odd trick, pam, basto, king and queen, and you, ye knockers, that with brazen throat the welcome visitors approach to note, farewell all quality of high renown, pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious town. Farewell. Your revels I partake no more, and Lady Teasel's occupations o'er. All this I told our bard. He smiled, and said twas clear I ought to play deep tragedy next year. Meanwhile he drew wise morals from his play, and in these solemn periods stalked away. Blessed with a fair like you, her faults who stopped, and closed her follies when the curtain dropped, no more in vice or error to engage, or play the fool at large on life's great stage. End of Act Five End of The School for Scandal by Richard Brinsley Sheridan